Assalamu alaikum. Oh, welcome to this live stream with Faraz Zahabi. Assalamu alaikum, Faraz. How are you doing? Assalamu Very good. Thank you very much for having me. It's always good to have you. And I love how you make yourself so available for the dawah because I just messaged <laughs> you a few days ago. I know you're super busy. What are you up to nowadays? Uh, just traveling for training camps and fights and uh, <clears throat> coming home to take care of training camps in Montreal as well. Uh, lots of guys training, lots of guys, lots of guys competing. I'm in the gym twice a day when I'm not traveling, so I'm happy to be here in Montreal this weekend, and uh, you know, getting getting ready for competition. Okay, excellent. Um, how do you keep yourself going? You've got you do your reading, right? Mm -hmm. You love your philosophy and your science, right? Mm -hmm. You've got that going on. Yeah. You're a family man. That's yeah. very important to you. That's true. Then you have to keep fit yourself in terms That's of your true. own personal health. And I remember when we met. That is true. Um, was it last year? And I remember you'd been fasting for like almost a day, and then you had very little to eat. And you have that like, explain your diet because it was like <laughs> um, listen, I do everything to that makes the body have energy. Like I'm a big believer. I do cardio every day, twice a day. Um, not always twice a day, but I do a cardio after training. Like I, I feel cardiovascular system has to be on point. Nutrition has to be on point. I do a lot of intermittent fasting. I do a lot of reading. I do a lot of traveling. So when I'm traveling, I have my audio books. I have all my documentaries that I want to study. That's a passion for me. That's something, I, it's not hard for me to do. It's just something I'm I'm drawn to. So that's really almost leisure. My leisure time is that. And um, I'm, I have a regiment. You know, I have a routine. I don't break my routine. And when I'm in travel, traveling will, will throw me a curveball. But even now, like, as I get older, I realize how important it is to stay on my routine or else... Um, it, it, I become unable to be productive and functional, you know, if like, if I don't sleep the right time, if I don't train the right amount, if I don't eat right, it really derails me, especially when I'm traveling and traveling can be tricky, you know, because you're hungry, the food is not the right food or you don't have, you, you know, you have to go through your routine, but we don't have the right equipment or training partners or whatnot. We have to do it with what uh, we have, but breaking the routine, the least amount possible, because the thing is. Creating a routine can hurt at the beginning, but once you're in that routine, it's just normal. It's just easy. Fasting yeah. is easy. Working outs are easy. As long as you build a routine, after three, four weeks of doing something, it becomes more and more automatic. After five, 10 years, it's like you don't even think about it. You know, So it's like it's like brushing your teeth, right? You don't wake up in the morning and ask yourself, oh, do I brush my teeth again? Should I do it? Should I? No, no, you have to do it. It's just you don't even think about it, right? So that's what I, I'm a big believer in routine. You know, routine is so important. Mm. I can imagine that. And also it's about habit stacking because mm -hmm. you have to be able to do a bunch of things without actually thinking. And you know, yeah. Salah is one of those things, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm, so you yeah. wake up and you know, it's so interesting that Muslims are disciplined as a culture because we all have to pray. We are disciplined by a culture because we're all told you're not allowed to do things which are detrimental for you, like alcohol and, and mm -hmm. fornication and these things. And then when it comes down to, say, your personal health and your personal goals and growth, Islam facilitates that. You know, it has this rich culture. Um, so as, mm -hmm. a, a, as a Muslim, as a strong believer, where does the mental toughness come from for you? Well, I, I think I'm deeply motivated to take care of my loved ones, my friends, my family, the organization that we're in. Like, I really want to see positivity, uh, success. And, uh, you know, when I grew up, it was tough. You know, I, we didn't have the best means. It was tough. I I kind of, uh, you know, missed out on certain things. And, and it, I don't want that for my kids. So that, that those are the things that pushed me. Like, my parents worked really hard, but they came here with nothing. They came to the country with nothing. They... They uh, immigrated because of the war in Lebanon, the civil war. So they really started grassroots and it was a tougher childhood than my kids have. That's for sure. You know, I tell them, you know, like you guys are you're living way better than, than, than your papa used to. We even have a, I mean, like, like my, my parents are really hardworking people, you know? So after I saw what they did to, to build the next generation beneath them, I feel like I got to do the same thing, but I instill it in my kids. I say, look, your life is better than mine. I hope, my grandkids is better than yours. And you just, so, just like, there's no cruise control. You know, we got to build, build, build. And inshallah, one day, even we have people in head of state. And inshallah, they bring 
good to the world. Honestly, that's the ultimate goal eventually because how do people become heads of state? Well, they build a business, they build success. Eventually, they're rich enough to, to go and push for the heads of state to become a head of state. You have to have money behind you. You have to have prestige. You have to have influence. Ultimately speaking, you want to see that the principles we teach our children eventually get adopted around the world, inshallah, yeah. one day. And ultimately, that comes from building and building and building. Like, look at the Trumps, for instance. His great-grandfather started buying hotels. <laughs> yeah. Now his great-grandsons are running the country. You yeah. know, but I mean, ultimately, if you want to make this world a better place, you got to push, push in success. And for me, it's like, what else are you going to do? You're going to sit at home, watch TV. What are you, you going to do? You know, it's I all I do me is work. I have family time and work, you know? Mm. We have our dean, we have our family, for our family. When it comes to family, for me, I have to work, 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 work. It's all for the family, you know, inshallah. And for the dean, of course, above all the dean. But the motivation is easy for me, you know? I look at the big picture, you know? What's the big picture? Yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. And just before we get started, there is one, one last thing which I did want you to speak about because this is something which is not highlighted enough which is discipline discipline is seen as a bad thing it's mm. seen something that we should rebel against and you know from a young age uh we don't want to be disciplined we don't we want to be free but you you come across as a very disciplined person um you know i remember you were speaking to me some years back about your study routine and what you mm. study that that's something you have to do and it's not something you're known for that's not your main bread and butter but you just do it so how do you create that level of discipline in your life because i'm sure a lot of young people watching they want to be like that they want to be disciplined but they find themselves themselves in a spiral of you know mediocre behavior and laziness and it's very difficult to get out of that quicksand when you're stuck in there i think I think discipline is one of the greatest, most pleasurable experiences in, in, in the world. Like, I mean, I, I think my, I, I discipline my kids in, in a fair, loving way, of course. I, I've seen, you know, some parents really take it overboard. Like recently there was a woman on the internet. She's a, she's a expert in child health care, a child uh, discipline. And she was caught starving her kids and being like really harsh on her children. And one of her kids actually literally ran away from home and was uh, begging the, neighbors for food because she would withhold oh, yeah. food from yeah, them yeah. and stuff like that like not nothing nothing in that regard whatsoever <laughs> i mean nothing yes, you know yeah that's that's much you know the the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam he was very gentle with children if you read his interaction with children he was very gentle and loving and and careful with them yeah but with that said kids love having defined borders you know i don't tell my kids hey what do you want for dinner i tell them look here's three choices you know i tell them here's three choices mm -hmm. we can have this this or that three choices you guys choose there's a flexibility but also i don't give them carte blanche i don't want them to be like hey why don't i uh, you know i don't want them to start thinking too outside the box either because i feel like i don't want them to you know you don't want an emperor child you know the child now he has everything he wants like if i was if i was a billionaire i still wouldn't give my kids everything i tell my kids you earn everything you're going to have, you're going to earn it. I tell them that. Why? Because I tell them one day I might die. I will die, of course, but I might die in your youth. And you're going to put your hand out because you're expecting somebody to give you something and nobody's going to give you anything. Yeah. So I teach them. I tell them, look, my job is to teach you how to be independent, thrive on your own. That's confidence. Not, oh, Papa will take care of it. Papa will put money in my pocket. Papa will buy my lunch. No, no, I want my kids to earn everything. So I tell my kids, look, if you do your training, you do your studies, you do everything you're supposed to do. The list of things I give you to do. Yeah, then you'll have uh, time on the internet. Yeah, then you'll have video game time. Yes, then I'll buy you that thing you wanted, whatever it may be. But everything is has to be earned. In my opinion, yeah. everything must be earned. You got to instill that in your children at a young age. I don't give my kids anything for free. And I have the means to give them things for free. I have the means to buy them luxuries. I don't. I also, I don't like luxuries. I always tell my kids, yeah, I like to live in the middle. Not super luxurious. And I'm not the guy who's going to sleep on a cardboard floor for my whole life. No. In the middle, I don't like hyper luxuries. I don't like it. Now, with that said, sometimes I'm I'm invited to go places like, you know, to tra training camps, and they and they treat me good. I always tell people if you see me something wearing something expensive, it was a gift. That's the only way you'll ever see. <laughs> Wallahi, if somebody gives me a gift, I'll wear it. But if it's not a gift, I'll never I'll, me, I'll oh, never okay. buy an expensive brand personally. I think people shouldn't waste their money with that. It's halal. I'm not telling people not to do it. If it's you know, some some chefs will say if you did you made your money halal, spend it the way you want. 
Me personally, I wouldn't drive a Lamborghini. I wouldn't drive a Bugatti. I wouldn't drive. Personally, I find it to be excessive, um, distasteful. It makes the youth want to fight and get the same amount, the same thing. It becomes like you know who's living the most lavish. I don't think that's what we're here for on this earth. Yeah. You know, I don't think. I think there's a lot more important things. I feel I feel like the West also we we've gone too crazy with these things. You know, like yeah. my kids want really expensive shoes. I'm like, no. Why would you have expensive shoes? Why would a young kid wear two hundred dollars shoes? Why? Well, it's status. It's you're telling your friends, look, me and my family were rich. That's really what it is. You know, you can buy a hundred dollar pair of shoes. They're just as comfortable. They're just as functional. And you want to impress your friends because you're wearing an. $200 pair of shoes like even I have a $500 pair it's, it's just it's becoming I think the West has become a little bit out of touch with what's important in life absolutely and well I, actually I don't want to contribute to that yeah no absolutely absolutely and talking about what's interesting talking about what's important uh you know in terms of the West materialism is obviously pushed by society as being something we should be geared towards we should be trying to become richer and more better looking and, and you know have this sort of social state uh, uh, status in society however when it comes down to the the status of god you know where is god in the whole thing and you know the interesting aspect of life not being materialism but actually the study of the natural world the application of the re uh, application of reason to the natural world leading us to be in awe of god like materialism is what's being pushed, but people still go towards that, don't they, for us? Like uh, today we're going to be speaking about Andrew Huberman, who has been popular for many, many years. Um, and just like yourself, you know, he's been on like uh, podcasts like the Joe Rogan show and, you know, people know him uh, for, his, for his science, but recently came out and he spoke about his faith. Now, before we play his video, before we, uh, you know, um, delve into that, I just want you to give your preliminary sort of thoughts on when we have a scientist or someone who generally is not known to be a science popularizer they're not known for their faith they're not known for you know a belief in god if anything they're known to be away from their faith so were you at all surprised when i sent you this video and uh, you know he's talking about his faith and i'm sure you've come across him before mm -hmm. were you at all surprised that such a um, such a public intellectual is now openly speaking about God. Um, a little bit, and I'll tell you why. Okay, there was a time where philosophers were scientists and scientists were philosophers. Yeah. And then over time, they split the two. More generally during the time of the Enlightenment. Before that, all the great thinkers were both philosophers and scientists. You could take a young man, teach him the scientific method. And he thinks the scientific method is all there is. If you have only if you only have a hammer in your tool toolbox, you think every problem is a nail. That's a famous uh, quote. If you teach these young kids the scientific method, but you don't teach them the axioms behind the scientific method, and if you don't teach them to think metaphysically, if you don't teach them, look, how did we get? To, what's the history of these axioms? What are these axioms? What is their nature? How do we? How do we? Um, uh, how do we rationalize these? How did we get to these axioms? What is their nature? How how certain are we of them? If you don't ask these questions, then it's not it's not um, unsurprising to me that they become atheists. It's not surprising to me because all they see is this one method. They think this one method is absolute. Because here's the thing, you know, one one Muslim thinker said it beautifully. He says, "Look, God gave you the senses to measure the dunya." Not to measure Allah. Okay, mm. you, you have your you have your scientific instruments. You have your senses. You have your intellect. Yes, you can see signs of God in nature, but this is not the scientific endeavor. Science. If people, if you put, if you put a hundred philosophers of science in a room and you ask them, figure out what's the science. What is science? What is it? Get in there. Talk about its axioms. Figure out its origin. What is this thing we've we practice. They're going to come out and they're going to tell you science is the it's the recognition of patterns and regularities in nature. That's it. That's what it boils down to. It happened in the past. We're predicting it's going to happen in the future. And this is what we believe causes this effect. That's what it is. It doesn't comment on God. It doesn't comment on morality. It doesn't comment on meaning. It doesn't answer the question of why. We need, a, we need another science. We need another... Um, 
when I say science, I don't mean scientific method. I mean, we need another discipline that answers those questions. Now, in the Muslim world, there's a major misunderstanding. Ghazali wrote a book called The Tahafut, The Destruction of the Philosophers. And Muslims thought, well, he's destroying the philosophers. Philosophy must be bad. Philosophy just means love of wisdom. And really today when we say philosophy, we're talking about the formal study of logic. Is logic haram? Of course not. There's no Muslim ever that said that logic is haram. People misunderstood it. When Ghazali was criticizing the philosophers, quote unquote, the philosophers, he was criticizing the people who are blind followers of Aristotle. He wasn't criticizing logical thinking. Other, there are other Muslim thinkers that said that logic, who, who has divine logic among, among us? Nobody. Okay, so when we use logic, we have to be humble when we use logic because nobody out there is the perfect logician. Okay, when you do math, do you make mistakes? Of course, we all do. We all make mistakes. We all make mistakes when we're studying math and we have to have our math verified and re-verified and things can be, uh, uh, there could be errors. At, the, at the, the highest level of mathematics, we can make an error. There is no divine logician among us okay there's only god only god has perfect logic right so muslim thinkers should be lovers should be masters of logic but also from a humble point of view because ultimately speaking ultimately speaking we all know god exists and that was a mercy from god it's not your perfect logic and your perfect scientific thinking that brought us to god yes logic can point to allah there's two ways to god muslim thinkers will tell you there are two ways to god one of them it's innate it's the fitra Every human being knows about Allah. I don't. I personally, I don't believe there exists an atheist in the world. Doesn't exist. A disbeliever is somebody who thinks submission to God is not won't lead to uh, uh, success. Okay, that's what a disbeliever is. A disbeliever is not somebody who is an atheist. There are no atheists in the heart of hearts of every human being. You already believe in Allah, and we could talk about how we we get to that understanding. It's in the Quran. It's explicit in the Quran. Every human being is a theist. We lie to ourselves. We deny our, we deny our deepest, truest beliefs. This is what uh, uh, this belief is. Okay? It's not that we don't believe in Allah. We all believe in God. That When I read the Quran, that's the perspective. I take it from, when I read the Quran, I find it only makes sense from this perspective. That every human being that's being spoken to already has direct experience with Allah. And we'll, we'll talk about details on that later. Will they let their fitra shine through or will they be distracted by something else? The whole dunya is a distraction. That's why I tell you, I don't like to become a collector of things. Oh, I have a Gucci. Oh, I have a Don, uh, whatever Dior. I don't even know the names. I have a, what's the most top brand? I don't know. Most expensive brand. Hmm. I'm not a collector of things. You know, that's not what I'm interested in in this world. So uh, I find that capitalism ha has good and bad. One major problem with capitalism is that the elite have all the money so you got to get the elite to buy more you got to get the elite not to have just one shirt you got to get him to pay a premium for that shirt and also you got to get him to buy 10 times more than what he needs you got to make him a collector of shoes but not just any shoe no these very expensive shoes because only the elite can accept uh, can can buy these shoes so when you walk around with this elite brand and honestly i can't even name you an elite brand. I don't even know the brands. Okay, I'm sorry to say, but you know, I've walked in a store and I've seen five hundred dollar pair of shoes. I find that to be absurd. I find it to be way, an absurd. Way, way more expensive than that. <laughs> Whatever more. it may be, my friends. My, if you need a five hundred dollar pair of shoes to feel good about yourself, I think honestly, you're surrounding yourself with the wrong people. I personally, uh, I would never buy a, a very expensive pair of anything. I, I like to buy normal. I'll buy a normal car. I'll buy normal clothes. I'll buy normal food. I don't need, uh, you know, the penthouse suite. Now, sometimes when I travel, it's given, you know, the, the I'm treated. You know, people invite me as a guest. You're a trainer, and they're going to treat me to something nice. That's the only time I'll accept it. But believe me, I, I'm, I'm only doing it to be polite. You know, I'm not the type of guy who's going to go and I want to live in the in the limousine. I don't want to be dr driven around in a limousine. That's not my style, okay? Because I think there are a lot more important things in life, and these things are just distractions from what's important in life and the worst part is you're giving a bad example to the youth now the youth they start stepping all over each other because they also want to have this prestige and that's why they'll like they'll still be tempted to lie cheat and steal to have this prestige to have this uh look at my shirt look at my expensive uh, 
car, home. Look, they want to show off to one another. They want to flex, as we say. Mm, absolutely. And, you know, uh, just a few minutes ago, you spoke about the fact that there are no atheists, right? Everyone deep down does actually believe. Now, as we're going to get into Huberman's faith, one of the things that comes to mind is obviously he's speaking about the brain. And that's something which is for him, it's just it's just shouting out God, right? When you spoke about there are no true atheists, one of the things I wanted to link it to is even the most well-known Darwinists in the world, right? The most well-known atheists in the world, they have to assume good design as a working assumption. So this is something which Richard Dawkins is explicit about in his book, River Out of Eden. Francis Crick, another Nobel uh, you know, prize-winning scientist, uh, biologist, atheist, he also says that biologists must constantly keep in mind that what they see evolved was not designed. So again and again, what you find with these people is that design is something they believe in, but they believe the design to be done by natural selection. They will not de deny the design. So deep down, like you said, they do have some sort of belief. That they, they can't deny that. And, and there is no such thing as a pure atheist. I, you know, I totally uh, agree with you there. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to share my screen play a little bit of the video and then um we, you know we could get your thoughts on it um yeah, but just before we start there's one more thing i just wanted to mention um i know you love the topic of randomness right <laughs> this this is this is one of your things um and recently um i was listening to william dembski i'm not sure if you know but you know this guy is absolutely brilliant i'm interviewing him tomorrow uh he published a book um with Cambridge University in 1996, 1998, the design inference, right? So one of the things that he does, and this will help us in, when we're analyzing what Huberman is saying, is he says that from a materialistic perspective, um, randomness is fundamental and design is something which emerges, right? But what he does is he inverts the problem. Mm -hmm. <laughs> he actually says, no, it's patterns which are the default and it's randomness which you have to prove if it's if it's not something that you can detect, uh, you know, uh, from a discernible. That's, that, this is my position, the latter one. Yeah, exactly. So he has this paper called Randomness by Design. And when you have that perspective, because you have to remember, it's not about empiricism. This is metaphysics, what Dembski is speaking about. He's speaking about you either start off with the idea that randomness is... Um, it has to be proven or randomness is the assumption, which is a materialistic perspective. Now, someone like Huberman, they clearly, when they're looking at, you know, the biological systems, their brain is ready to detect patterns because of their metaphysical worldview. That's what's important. So as we play this video, um, that's one of the things that we're going to be highlighting. So <clears> I'll just <throat> play the video now. When you're talking about the brain and all the... I mean, you, you mentioned it last night and this, this had me thinking, it's like, when you think how all that works, I have to take an aside and say, how could that happen in nature is without a creator? Yeah. So, well, here's the thing. I mean, we know that the programs, meaning genes, so genes, DNA, and there's DNA, then there's RNA, and then there's proteins. And proteins are the action end of the game where they say, hey, like, grow over here. Don't grow over there. Mm -hmm. You know, um, become this kind of cell, dopamine cell or a serotonin cell. We know that those mechanisms are incredibly well conserved from mice to humans. Now, mm -hmm. certain things happen in the human brain that you don't see in other species, like the elaboration of the parts of the brain that are involved in context and planning, mm -hmm. especially. But the memory systems, the ones that control hormones, breathing, heart rate, they're very similar. Mm -hmm. Not exactly the same, but very similar. Okay. When you start to study and understand brain development, as I did, or neuroplasticity, or dopamine, you have to. Meaning, I don't care if you're an atheist, agnostic, or believer in creator. You have to step back and just go. Wow. Wow. Now, then, of course, there's this difference among scientists as to who believes in God, who mm -hmm. doesn't. I'll just go on record. I'm very comfortable saying it. I believe in God. I do. Mm -hmm. I think there are many things that science can explain. Mm -hmm. There are certain things science can't explain. 
But I'll even go a step further, which is that all the elements of science are entirely compatible with the idea of there being a God. And I'm not the first scientist to say this. I mean, mm -hmm. Einstein believed in God. Um, Carl Jung, one of the greatest psychologists ever, clearly believed in God. There are many atheist scientists. There are agnostic scientists who are just kind of like unsure, right? Mm -hmm. And, you know, for me, I'm in absolute awe, absolute awe of biology. Mm -hmm. It's just incredible that we're sitting here having this conversation. It's just, it's with language that they're little sound yeah. waves that are, you're perceiving and understanding. I mean, it's just, and I think the brain represents the apex of incredible in terms of biology. Like the heart is interesting. The immune system is interesting. The liver is interesting, but the brain is unbelievable. Yeah. I mean, think about the number of different ways you can move your body compared to another species. Mm -hmm. Think about what you did today. Think about what I was attempting to do today, right? Yeah. Spectacular. Think about technology, these lights, the, you know, Tesla cars, spaceships. I mean, yeah, the internet. I mean, unbelievable. Mm -hmm. So what are your initial thoughts on what he's saying? I think belief in God <clears throat> or disbelief in God, because it's something we all know. At the core of our being, we all know. And the denial or acceptance becomes psychology. He saw all this information, all this, all these incredible happenstances, supposedly. And he's like, wait a second, this is way too sophisticated. And he had a humbling experience, and he, he discovered what we call the fitra. He understood that, look, like the Quran says, you were... You came to life the first time, Allah is going to bring you back again to life the second time. Think about it for a second. You used to not exist. Yeah. And now you exist. You think Dawkins knows how you came to be? He has no idea. Listen, we, we got to be humble here. Mm. I, I like to study every world expert. I, I'm a big fan of knowledge. I'm, I'm deep in the rabbit hole. I can tell you, the way it came to be is far more complex than we can wrap our minds around. And the Quran says, Allah tells us, you were not a witness of your creation. You were not. <laughs> there's going to be a lot of question marks. You're not going to know. Yeah. But science is the belief, and I'm telling you this as a philosopher of science, that the future will behave like the past. The yeah. Quran, the Quran is constantly telling you: look at the cycles of night and day. We're seeing patterns and regularities, and it says it's a sign for people who think. I was once non-existent. I came into existence. I'm seeing things die around me. I know I will die. I'm going to go back to the starting point. Yeah. The Quran is telling you, like you rose the first time, we're going to bring you up the next time. But here, the Quran even goes further than that. The Quran tells you, when you sleep, Allah takes your soul. Now, in the highest levels of philosophy, we know that there is no differentiation between dream and awake. Now, this is a topic most people don't like to talk about, but here's the hard fact. Let me tell you a hard fact. We don't know the difference between awake and asleep. When you're sleeping, you think you're on a podcast and you had breakfast this morning, but that dream just started one second ago. And you have a you have a history of your day. You thought you went to the gym and you wrestled and you wrote a book and you you that's all and in the, in the dream, everybody's giving you consensus. Oh, there's a glass of water on the table. Yes, you have consensus. Guess what? In the dream. You, in a, we have dreams. All we know is we're jumping from one world to the other. And the Quran tells us this. Allah takes your soul. He shows you another world. Now, I'll mm -hmm. tell you something. People try to uh, differentiate between material stuff and mind. I don't. I, I differentiate, like the Quran says, seen and unseen. Things I saw on the outside and things I experienced within. This is a far more uh, accurate description. But back to what we were saying about Uberman, because I don't want to go on a tangent here. I think he's humble enough to understand the miracle of existence. Mm. It's ex incredibly humbling. However, some people, in my opinion, have a psychological uh, reaction and they deny it and instead they invoke another God. And this other God is nature. They're going to say, no, it's just all natural. Now, what is nature? Nature is something that man didn't do. Okay, so if I if I see a pile of rocks and I could see it's a, it it was stacked in a way that man did it, I won't say that's a natural uh, uh, occurrence. But if I see a, a rock formation that I think no man a man didn't design that, I'm going to say that's natural. It just it's it's a happenstance. It fell that way, 
And what's responsible for it to fall that way? That's these blind random forces. Hmm. They always eventually bring it to a blind random force. What is this blind random force? Well, it's just the patterns and regularities we see. There is no rhyme and reason to them. Yeah. Okay. Now, there's a lot to unpack here. Number one, when we say the word nature, this is something called emergence. Okay. So if I asked you, Sabur, what is nature? You're going to be like, well, you'd have to define it with particulars. Nature is a universal. It's an emergent property. You're going to say, look at those flowers over there. That's nature. Okay, so I go and I mow down all the flowers. I, I put them in mulch. I light them on fire. I burn them all. And you're like, no, nature still exists. You see you see that rock formation. You see that water uh, cycle. You see the, the clouds in the sky. These are all instances of nature. It's not brought up upon by man. So if I, if I chop down trees and I build you a log cabin, you're going to be like, no, that's not nature. That was brought about by man. That's artificial. Man, man had his hand in that. That was not by the blind forces. It was not brought together by the blind forces. Nature is a byproduct of particulars. So for instance, if I eliminated all the particulars, if I took away the water cycle, if I took away mountains, if I took away the, 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 all the leaves and flowers and every insect on earth and every animal, and it was, it was an empty universe. If I presented to you an empty universe, you'd be like, you have no idea of nature. Nature only came about once you saw particulars. Mm -hmm. Nature is dependent on the particulars. If there's no particulars, there is no nature. Nature is a projection of the mind. You know, <laughs> scientists love to say that the, the mind is just an emergence of the brain. Well, I'm telling you, nature is an emergence of the particulars. I'm giving them the same argument they give us. So when I ask you, where did this come from? Oh, it's just nature. No, no, no. You cannot say nature. You cannot say nature. I'll tell you why you can't say nature. Nature is not a thing observed in the universe. It's not. It has no properties for us to measure. Nature yeah. is, a, is just a linguistic trick. It's a name we give to a collective of particulars. That's it. That's all it is. Nature is not a thing. I can't put nature in a test tube. It has no observable properties. All I can say is those flowers over there are part of this label we give, we, the collective we call nature. It's a part of a collective. It's not a thing. It's not a force out there. That's why Allah, he says, he's one. Allah is a particular. He's not a label. He's not a concept. Allah is not a concept that emerged from ob observance of particulars. Nature, if you see people, people, it, it's a, there's a linguistical issue here. People, when they say the word nature, they don't understand. They think they're, they think they're talking about a force. Something with measurable properties. Nature has no measurable properties. Nature, ma nature is a name of a collective of particulars. We have to look at the world as particulars. Nature is a by nature is just a name we give things. It's not a force out there in the world. Hmm. So that, that's one very important threshold because the thing is we could do the same thing now with randomness because all of evolution, evolution itself is a, is a emergent property. Can you show me a, a physical attribute of evolution I can see? Is evolution itself, evolution is just a name they give to think, <laughs> particulars they observed in nature. There is no mechanism in the human body that's responsible for the evolutionary process. The evolutionary process is a label they give to things they believe happened and because of a happenstance or a random force. And then they give it a label. They give it a name. It's, it's a bit hard to wrap our minds around. I get it. Uh, you know, I can give you a simpler example. Like, for instance, you know, in philosophy, we say, how many grains of sand do you need to make a heap? Let's say we, look, we see a heap of sand. Okay, a little heap of sand on the desk. And I take away one grain of sand at a time. At one point, I'm going to raise my hand. I'm going to be like, hey, it's not, a, it's not a heap of sand anymore. But you might raise your hand a few grains of sand earlier. There's no exact definition, right? Because we're just giving a label to that number of particular grains of sand. When you take out all these emergent properties, what are we left with? What are we left with? We're left with... And actually, 
we're left with observing a universe that makes sense. Yeah. By calling, by calling things random. Okay, so some people, some people believe that the universe just existed. There's no cause, okay? I'm sure he's going to get to the fact that he believes there's a cause because look how wondrous it is. If you say there's no cause, you're completely, you're shooting science in the kneecaps. You're taking science and you're shooting them in the kneecaps and you're crippling science. You're undermining our entire axioms of science. Why? Because if it's true that the universe just came to be and there's no explanation, then why don't we explain everything else that way? When John F. Kennedy was assassinated, why don't we just say, no, his head might have just exploded? Why do we have to say that somebody had to fire the bullet? Maybe there just was a bullet that appeared. Maybe it wasn't Lee Harvey Oswald. Maybe there wasn't a second shooter. Maybe there wasn't even a first shooter. Nobody thinks that way. They, atheists only say that when it comes to the first cause. That's the only time now they want to play dumb. They want to say, no, look, we have a, a, a special we, we have a special circumstance now where cause and effect is completely irrational. Things just happen for no good reason. Yeah. It's inconsistent. For instance, to say that things can just happen for no good reason. You know, we have something in philosophy we call the PSR, principle of sufficient reason. Everything that could have been otherwise has a, a rational cause, even if we don't know what it is. Yeah. It ha it's, if it's not true by if it's not true by definition, then it has to have a cause, and that cause has to make sense. If you deny that in any circumstance, under any circumstance, you have now de denied all of science. All of science. Because if something can just happen magically with no cause, no explanation, then that could I could explain anything like that. Why do you get a car? Why why can't I exp why can't I explain every other event? Hmm. If you tell me water boils at 100 degrees Celsius at a certain at atmospheric pressure. You've recognized that pattern over time. Why can't I step in and say, no, 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 there's no, there's no correlation between heat and atm atmospheric pressure. It's just a happenstance. It just so happens to be fall that way. The cars just landed like that every single time. It's absurd. We all realize it to be an absurdity. The problem gets worse. You see, Richard Dawkins, when he wrote his book, uh, The Blind Watchmaker, he's trying to say, look, in a, in a great a number of, universes if you if you if you had a crazy amount of universes going on at the same time you would find and I, you would find something that looked like a pocket watch and you would mistakenly think there was a watchmaker dawkins is telling us look it's random forces there were so many fluky configurations that it just so happened to land as a perfectly nice pocket watch. But you have to understand there are countless causes and it's been an infinite amount of time. And then these parts have been jumbled in so many ways that you're one day you're going to land on a perfect uh, stopwatch, uh, uh, watch, watch. And you're going to think there was a watchmaker. That's his, that's his mm -hmm. argument in a nutshell. Okay. Mm -hmm. It's just a happenstance, but because the numbers are so astronomical, you can't fathom it. Now, here's where he goes really wrong. Is that human beings, we are in the system of determinism. Every word I say, every action I take can also be attributed to the supposed random forces. Mm -hmm. We ourselves do not escape determinism. Determinism is Newton's laws. Okay, Newton's laws of motion. They describe everything. Everything we see in the universe that moves, Newton's laws pretty much describes it. Okay, even yeah. some people are going to invoke quantum physics. We can talk about that later. But there's su there's super determinism. Um, that's it's just poor philosophy on on on, on the scientific endeavor. Uh, just for for those, I'm, I'm just going to make a quick pit stop here. Reach Sean Carroll's uh, something deeply hidden. Even he says it can't be random. It cannot be something deeply hidden. Read Sean Carroll's uh, something deeply hidden. Most philo most scientists don't even know. Look, have you ever heard the, the saying, shut up and calculate? Have you ever heard that saying? No. <laughs> when they were trying to understand what, what, the, what the wave function was, he's like, Feynman said, just shut up and calculate. It works. Let the philosophers handle why. 
He, he, Feynman famously said, shut up and calculate. The wave function works. It doesn't make sense. You can't have a, a, a counterclockwise spin and it'd be spinning clockwise at the same time. That's a, that defies a law of non-contradiction. Yeah. But he said, look, it works. Sean Carroll doesn't literally believe when asked, does it literally believe, does he literally believe it? He says, no, but you can think about it that way, even though it's not literally true. This is a topic for another day, but one day they're going to land on super determinism, in my opinion. But that's, that's another conversation for later or another day even. What I was telling you is we're, we observe determinism. We are confident in determinism. All of science is based on determinism. One object collides in, into another. The three basic laws of motion explains, those three basic laws explain all action, even the very actions of my mouth right now. People have to understand this. In science, they're going to tell you, look, there are chemicals jostling around my brain. That's what's moving my tongue. And those chemicals are due to things in the past that happened before I even existed. Yeah. And the things pushing all the buttons and moving all the material, those are blind forces. Well, that would mean that our very conversation right now is a byproduct of blind forces. Yeah. Which is an impossibility. Because I'm having a first-person experience of rational thinking and thought. Are all the words coming out of my mouth right now just random noises? Or are you having an experience of reason and logic? If you're having a, an experience of reason and logic, then it wasn't blind forces. If we lived in a world where our God exists, you would expect to see morality, free will, logic. If we lived in a world of random forces, I would never know it. I would never know it. You it's know, something, it's something to, to really think about. It is. And while you were speaking, it reminded me of something you said previously, um, which is that scientists were in the past known as natural philosophers. So mm -hmm. Newton, Einstein, uh, you know, Kepler, all these guys were known as natural philosophers. And science only branched out as a specialist field uh, in the 20th century. So what you're speaking about here in terms of some of the uh, proponents of um, atheism are people who are essentially doing philosophy using science and you can't escape that you, you will make metaphysical implications based upon your scientific findings but i see you going back again and again on randomness and why is that because fundamentally that's going to be your starting point towards atheism or towards deism so if you start with the paradigm that everything is random and patterns and design and intelligence are emergent properties that's one paradigm mm -hmm. if you start off with a paradigm that actually there is no randomness everything is determined they are total patterns in the world and for something to be random it actually has to break these patterns now for us i just want to highlight and i want you to emphasize this point this is not a point based upon empiricism this is a perspective that you begin with that colors the data because what we find time and time again is that atheists, uh, scientists in particular, are saying the conclusion that we are the product of a random process is what we find in science. No, no, no. That's the conclusion that you started off with and you mm. use that to color the data. So when people like Daniel Dennett are saying, yeah, they're saying consciousness is an illusion. That's not based on scientific evidence. That's actually an assumption of <laughs> monism that's actually an assumption of materialism so the assumptions you begin off with and then the data is actually colored because i think for a lot of people um they don't understand empiricism will not lead you to change your metaphysical worldview it's your metaphysical worldview which will help shape the the colors and the sizes of the empirical data that's actually coming your way can i ask you a question if daniel dennett slipped and fell and broke his leg and he was in agony. And he asked me to take him to the ambulance. To call me an ambulance, please. Get me to the hospital. And I told him, well, Daniel, it's all an illusion, the pain. We're not in a rush. <laughs> it's just an illusion. Relax. There is no pain. Yeah, You're not in a critically vital uh, situation. Don't worry. We'll take our time calling the ambulance. Would he see that as an illusion? He's no. completely wrong. Our conscious experience is what we're most certain of. Mm -hmm. We are most certain. We're having a first-hand experience. 
The Quran warns people this. It, the Quran, when 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 people are put into the hellfire, people are told, "Look, this is for what you used to deny. You can't deny this no more." The first person experience, nobody falls down and breaks their leg and says, "Oh, this pain is an illusion. My intellect supersedes this situation." No, 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 no. Pain and joy are known firsthand. That's what people don't understand because we've been so we've been so molded by the scientific paradigm that we've forgotten there are the types of logic and there are types of logic that are more certain than the scientific uh, yeah. uh, system the scientific system is very sound very important we should never deny science we should be lovers of science but science is transient it can change in the future and i'll tell you something what you were just talking about just a minute ago is what i call Copernicus all over again. When we're gonna re we're gonna realize that we have it exactly backwards. It's design and then randomness is an emergent property. Not we have randomness and then design is an emergent property. It's backwards. They got it backwards. They're gonna have a revolution again, maybe hopefully sooner than later. And they're gonna realize just like when once we thought the sun goes around the earth, now we realize it's the earth going around the sun. We had a Coper Copernican re revolution. I call it Copernicus all over again. When they're gonna realize they got it exactly backwards. They presuppose randomness, and then they think design is a emergent property. It's actually backwards. We have design, and randomness is an emergent property. That's why we have the we have the you know the God in the Quran says, "I know what's behind you, what's in front of you." Meaning, you randomness is what blinds us from knowing the future. The future is knowable. Listen, the future is hundred percent knowable. It's not me that says that. Pierre Simon Laplace, Isaac Newton would agree with this. To say, look. We have the information we need now to know what's going to happen in the future. Determinism is a real thing. Now, they're telling you, because we don't have the divine power to calculate, we have to round off numbers. We cannot compute all these variables. We need the intellect of God yeah. to know. That's why when God says he knows, I believe it because obviously he's God. He knows all the variables. He can round, he has, he has a divine calculator, so to speak. You know, because if you round down numbers, if you round numbers, when you make calculations, you get irrational numbers. You have to round them up. It's gonna slightly displace your your your. You're gonna have a compounding effect of error. Okay, so let's say I'm hitting billiard balls on the table, but I gotta round up the numbers. Eventually, I'm gonna get the answer wrong. Sooner or later, after your fourth or fifth shot, I'm gonna be a little bit wrong. Why? I had to round up the numbers. I don't have what Laplace called a divine calculator. I would need a divine calculator. I would need to know the infinite amount of variables there is but if i had that information the universe is clockwork the universe is determined yeah now it's beyond our grasp but the author of the quran is telling you it's within his grasp it makes total sense the quran makes total sense from this vantage point yes there's design first and then randomness is an emergent property that's why i tell people i have no problem with evolution i only have problem with them attributed to randomness that's my only problem with evolution well, see this is interesting because when it comes to biological evolution, without randomness, the ontological randomness that they claim exists, which they can't prove, which is not even a scientific question. It's Darwin, not a scientific question. That's yeah. very important. It's, yeah. a, it's, it's a question for philosophers. Exactly. <clears throat> the entire the entire worldview that they've built Darwinism, um, that, they, that they've built using Darwinism, using the blind uh, evolutionary process breaks apart because now we are no longer accidental. Now we cannot say morality is a, co a biological uh, construct. We can't say any of these things. So you see, one of the reasons why secularism and atheism took off after Darwin is because people believe that finally he has freed uh, the, the biological systems from being attributed to the divine because we can now speak about random variations later random mutations and natural selection working on the uh, on these uh, which is a non-random process working on 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 a random process so therefore we can build an entire atheist genesis story using this but as soon as you take out randomness as soon as you say sorry you can't have randomness you can't prove randomness the entire power of the atheist Darwinist perspective disappears instantly, which is why one of the things which I note, uh, which I remember is our first conversation, which was during COVID, 
the very first thing that you pointed out was this thing about randomness because as soon as you show them there is no true randomness then the entire power of the atheist evolutionary argument falls apart in fact we we don't even need to use the word evolution we could just say uh, life processes uh you, you know the processual perspective transmutation like it doesn't really matter how you describe the processes of life. What actually matters is, is there ultimately intelligence behind it? Because one of the things which I've been researching recently, and this is because of the Dembski interview I have tomorrow, is how design is already part of the scientific enterprise. But they just deny that design when it comes to design, which is non-material. So, for, for example... Mm -hmm. One of the things which is very interesting is for approximately four billion years. Now, this is this is what we have to keep in mind. We've been told that the evolutionary story is to go from simplicity to complexity. Yet we find that the simplest cell, which Darwin believed mm -hmm. to be blob of it's incredibly complex. It, it's incredibly complex. It's like a sophisticated automated city, not you know, uh, not jello. So Francis Crick who won the Nobel Prize for discovering the, the structure of DNA, he actually came up with the theory, not came up, he, he actually expanded upon um, uh, uh, the earlier, uh, so basically panspermia, directed panspermia. So directed panspermia is, panspermia is the general idea that there's organic molecules which are going around the universe and they land on Earth. And uh, from that, uh, we, we actually get the origin of life. Um, now, directed panspermia is actually when they're sent down to Earth, right? Spaceships, rockets, whatever it is. Now, why did he come up with this idea? Because the first cell he realized, or, or group of cells, were incredibly complex. So in his book, Li Life Itself, one of the things that he does is he speaks about intelligent design, the theory of intelligent design. But here, the intelligent design are extraterrestrial beings. So as long as it's not God. So what we have to keep in mind is that intelligence is is such a key component of scientific thinking so when we have say somebody who's studying um say the hippocampus right so here in london uh, uh ucl uh university college london they did a study with uh cab drivers you know i'm sure you've seen those black cab drivers in london but, uh, so they don't actually use um you know uh waves or, or, or google maps they actually map out all of these thousands of streets in London, the landmarks and all these things. So these group of neuroscientists at uh, UCL, what they decided to do was study these uh, cab drivers, right? And what they realized is the part of the brain, which is responsible for spatial memory at the hippocampus, um, the posterior part of it actually grows in these cab drivers mm -hmm. Um, because of the, the, the level of, uh, you know, study that they have to do, which is approximately four years. And likewise, there was another study that was done on Einstein's brain. And because mm -hmm. Einstein used the violin, that impacted his brain. So your brain is impacted. So this plasticity that Huberman was talking about, you know, these things, your life experiences shape your brain. Your, your, your physical brain is actually impacted by your life experiences. So design is an assumption which you have to have in order to do biology. Now, those people who say, no, it's not. All, all, I'll, all I'll simply say to them is natural selection is there to try and optimize adaptations, which is the entire argument of the, bl of the blind watchmaker. Now, the blind watchmaker is essentially saying, look, there is design, but that design is undirected, unguided, and random. Mm -hmm. It's a blind okay? process. It's a blind process. However, it's not saying there is no design. But here is a huge problem with this. If you, if you admit to design, which all biologists do, then you have to show how natural selection as the designer and God as the designer or some sort of a higher intelligence, how those two differentiate. Now, the very difficult thing, and for us, this is a challenge for them. Mm -hmm. How do they differentiate between the design of natural selection and the design of God? Because you have to have two things in mind. One is constraints that you have biologically, 
and the second is the sum of all purposes. So, for example, if I prop open this door, not with a doorstop, but with a gift, somebody may turn around and say, that doesn't make any sense. Why would this is a terrible design? Why mm -hmm. would someone prop open a door with um, a gift, right? A mm -hmm. wrapped up gift as opposed to a doorstop? Well, actually, this is a misplaced uh, challenge because you don't know the sum of my purposes. My purpose may be opening the door for which I can use a door uh, door stopper, but my purpose may also be I want to surprise my mum with a gift. So I want to prop open the door and do this. So what we have to keep in mind is bad design and good design is based upon the sum of your purposes and the sum of your biological constraints. So natural selection, if you're going to say natural selection Opto uh, creates, uh, you know, optimizes biological features, and you want to uh, stick to methodological adaptationism or ultra adaptationism, wh whatever you want to call it. You have to accept intelligent design to some degree, because the two types of design you cannot show how one can take place without the other. So one of the things that <coughs> Huberman points out, and I think this is a very important segue, is whether you're an atheist, you're agnostic, or you're a theist. You have to be in awe of this design. That's the first thing he says. Mm -hmm. The second thing he says is he, he essentially challenges the God of the gaps perspective. He says, look, science ex can't explain certain things. Science can explain other things. I believe all of those things are still, is, I'm paraphrasing what he's saying. He believes that all of those things are still attributed to some sort of intelligence. And that that's mm -hmm. something anybody that can... Uh, uh, play back the clip you'll see that he's essentially challenging the, the god of the gaps perspective so i think one of the things for us that we have to keep in mind is that whenever the argument for bad design or good design is being used you have to accept alongside natural selection intelligent design and you have to accept we are no longer doing science we are now mm, in, in the philosophy. realm of philosophy mm. you know sean carroll said it best he said look don't expect scientists to be any better at philosophy than every, everyday people. He said that in an interview. I was listening to one of his uh, discussions he was having and he was like, and I realized, and then I found another Einsteinian quote along the same things, you know, the worst philosophers are scientists. Why? Because they're so, and look, I love science, okay? But they're so ingrained in this one method. They don't go outside this one pa parameter. We have to go back to the days where scientists were philosophers, philosophers were scientists. We have to yes. go back to those days. Now, there's also, what you said was really interesting because there's a lot of psychology behind why the West is so atheistic. Yeah. The West, they were, the West was once upon a time the great Roman Empire. The great Roman Empire converted to Christianity. When the great Roman Empire converted to Christianity, Yada collapsed about 400 years later. So they were champions of the world and then they kind of collapsed. And then they went to a dark age. When they went through the Dark Age, they were hit by the Black Plague. The Black Plague killed the clergy just like it killed every other people. The church started to lose its power. At that time, the church didn't want, didn't like science, math, history, logic, as much as it left of the Bible. The, anything that went anywhere near contradicting the Bible was reprimanded. There was house arrest. Now, there was good and bad. Not all Christians were seeing the world this way. But because, I mean, for instance, Galileo was a Christian and he was very open minded towards science. Okay. But there were people in power at the time who you might call uh, extremist. Okay. That had a certain worldview. And, you know, uh, Newton was scared of house arrest. Uh, Descartes was put under house arrest. A lot of great thinkers were put under house arrest because why? They're flirting with science. They're flirting with maybe contradicting or telling us how the world might have come to be, even though they were Christian themselves. So I don't want to lump all Christians together. There were great books. There were great Christian thinkers, and there were some that were very, uh, I would say, close-minded and extremist. When the Black Plague hit, now it was time to publish our books. Now it was the time to say, look, we think the world is not the center of the universe. Now was the time to voice your opinion. Why? The clergy had lost its power. And then you had the Renaissance. Let's go back to Aristotelian thinking. Let's go back to how we used to do it when we were great, when we were Romans. This is what we call the Enlightenment. Go back to Aristotelian thinking, logical thinking, not just the Bible tells us. And we, no, 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 now let's go back to logical thinking. Islam had a very different route. That's what people don't understand is Muslims, we were nothing before Islam. 
We were not champions. We didn't exist. The reason, the only reason the Romans and Persians didn't conquer the Ar Arabia is because there was nothing to conquer. Why would you want to <laughs> conquer sand dunes? What are you going to take? Their mud huts, their, he their, their tents. They have nothing. They have no structure. They have no science. They have no plumbing. They have no technology. There is nothing for us. It wasn't worth dominating. We have 3,000 years of Arabic history and it was nothing until the Prophet <coughs> came. He civilized the Arabic world. He gave us a tax system. You can't have civilization without tax. He gave us laws. Now the safest place in the, in the world for a woman to walk from one place to another is Medina. The safest place. It was the most dangerous place. Now it's the safest place. Why? The coming of Islam. A hundred years after the coming of Islam, now the Muslims are at the cutting edge of science and technology. We had our enlightenment age because of Islam. Not this, not in spite of Islam, but because of Islam. So we have a very different relationship. Later on, the Muslims, in my opinion, adopted more Christian views. We had a lot of Christians that converted to Islam and they brought their views with them. And I find that there was a period where nowadays you hear Muslims talk and it sounds a lot like a certain period of Christianity. I, in my opinion, Muslims should love science, logic, mathematics. Everything that's science and logic and STEM, we should love it. That for us, in my opinion, the Quran tells you so many times to think rationally. Who's more rightly guided, the blind or the seeing? We are people of evidence. We are people of logic. We're supposed to be. Now, the early Muslims, in my opinion, they lived up to it. The later Muslims, I think they adopted Christian attitudes. But we we only rose after our religion came. Whereas the, the Europeans, they crashed when their religion came. So they have a bitterness. If you talk to scientists, oh, they talk about, oh, so-and-so was under house arrest. These, these papers weren't published. They were hidden. The church, the church had their boot on our throat. Nowadays, okay, they're very secular and they think, oh, we're great despite of Christianity, not because of Christianity. That's the general attitude in the West. Christianity, uh, this is where this negative attitude comes from. The Muslims, we have a completely different attitude, completely. We love Islam because we were nothing before Islam. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, the Christian history in terms of its relationship with the science, there's been a caricature that's been made by new atheists about what happened in that period. What we have to keep in mind is Kepler, Newton, Galileo, all these people, they were believers in God. So this spat was not actually to do with Christianity versus some secular liberal thinkers. It was actually a particular, um, you could say, the Catholic Church stopping what they believed to be a reformation, what they were actually defending was Aristotle. And they were not really defending even the Bible. They were just defending that perspective because they're just scared of any type of change. However, what we have to keep in mind, and this is true even during Darwin's time, is this idea that, okay, you have this um, Victorian thinker who's, who's coming forward and he's coming up with these heretical ideas and then he's got all this religious opposition. Actually, no. What you'd find is actually... They were thinkers before Darwin, including mm -hmm. his grandfather, Erasmus Darwin, Lamarck, um, who were coming up with these ideas which were going against Christian doctrine, but they were tolerated to an extent. So they, what they've done is they've built up this narrative of it was theism, right, Christian theism, uh, you know, uh, Christianity, a uh, religion versus uh, atheist liberal thinkers or whatever they were. And they've taken that history, that false history, and then they've exported it to the entire world. And they've told the Muslim world, um, don't bother with your history. Take our history and we're going to superimpose our luggage onto you, right? Our mm -hmm. luggage onto you. So what happened with us is exactly what's, what's going to happen with you. But what we have to understand is that anybody who looks at the historical record of Islam, Islam and science, it will see that Muslims were right at the cutting edge of science. And even though we've been, you know, behind for many, many centuries, that intellectual tradition, just like Plato is celebrated, right? We should be celebrating, you know, the, the, the early Muslims and we should be writing books about them. And, and let me, let me, let me quote you Neil deGrasse Tyson. He says, the Muslims were the scientific golden age and there was no age like it nor before no after yes yes you should see the hate comments he gets in that video people are insulting him 
He's asking people, why do you think we call it Arabic numerals? Why do you think all the uh, three three quarters of the stars in the sky have Arabic names? Like he's telling you, like, wh where do you think it all came from? The algebra is an Arabic word. Algorithm is an Arabic word. Like he's trying to tell them because now the information age, they've, they've, they're Eurocentric. Mm. The whole everything good came from Europe. Every look, I love Europe. Europe. A lot of good things came from Europe. Yes, but it built on the Arabs, and the Arabs they built on the Greeks too, and the Greeks they built on Sumerians or whatnot, the Egyptians. We can't see, now. We have proof that Py Pythag the Pythagorean theorem doesn't originate with Pythagoras. Knowledge is passed down from one civilization to the other. One civilization rises, one civilization crumbles. The Quran talks about this. Truth is not belonging for one person or another. Truth is for the whole world. Now, some civilizations rise, they have uh, scientific thinking, then they reach a level of decadence and they crash. Usually it's corruption that makes us crash. The Muslims became enamored with the material world at one point. They got so rich, they were so powerful. And there's, there's a lot more to it. Of course, there was the, the Genghis Khan and you know there, there was a lot of uh, wars, etc. There's a lot to it. You know, when you ask... Uh, historians, what, why did the Muslim Empire collapse? It, you don't get a straight answer. It's so many. Same thing with R Roman Empire. It's complicated. It's a complicated issue. You have to study it. You start drawing a picture in your mind, but it's never a full picture. It's history. History is not an exact science. But you're a hundred percent right. It's it's a sh it's a shame that Muslims don't know how much Islam brought to the world, not yeah. just religiously uh, and in terms of law, etc. The West looked up to the Muslims for hundreds and hundreds of years. Let me ask you something. In the Supreme Court, they have the 18 great lawgivers. They have statues of the 18 great lawgivers. You know who one of them is? Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam. Fact check me on this. He's holding the Quran. They made a statue. And Moses alayhi salam. They saw Islam as bringing a great civilization with great laws that make total sense. They're just. They're fair. The 18 great lawgivers, one of them is Islam. It comes from Islam, the Quran. The Prophet Muhammad salam, holding the Quran. Europe used to look up at the Islamic world. And of course, the Islamic world also revered the Greeks. They brought a lot of good as well. And so on and so forth. Because like Ghazali said, he says, I'm not going to reject something or accept something because Aristotle said it. It has to stand on its own merit. We have to cross-examine it. We so, have to get away from this prejudice. Yeah. Just on that point, Faraz, I just wanted to say something. So you made a brilliant point about what Imam uh, Ghazali's epistemology was in, in regards to skepticism. If there was nothing the Muslim world did for the scientific method or for philosophy in general, other than contribute to the scientific method itself, because you have to remember, all the science that we're doing today is the product of the scientific method. Mm -hmm. Now, the scientific method was developed by Muslims themselves. Now, if you look at the history of the scientific method, you can look at the works of David Lindbergh, Patricia Farah, you know, just, just look at all the people who are speaking about the scientific method. I mean, the book I would recommend is Science of 4,000 Year History by Farah, right? In that you will find Muslims contributed to the way of thinking. Mm -hmm. that This idea that actually it was, it was just in the last couple of hundred years in the West where there was a scientific revolution, no, that's not actually true. Science goes back a very long time. And one of the points of inflection was about a thousand years ago, Hassan ibn Haytham. Now, mm -hmm. Hassan ibn Haytham, people say, oh, he did this work, uh, this fantastic work in physics. You know, he made this uh, contribution to optics. Forget all that. Just look at his contribution to the scientific way of thinking. Mm -hmm. And he links back his scientific work to wanting to get closer to Allah. Right. We have to keep this in mind. I mean, this this is the crux of the mm -hmm. point. You know, theism is not something which is there to undermine the foundations of science. Naturalism did not create the environment conducive for science to flourish. So what we find is that science flourished many points in history. And those points, those people were theists. They believed in God. Here in the 20th century, in the 21st century, yes, a lot of scientists happen to be atheists. But that doesn't actually mean but they're anything. No, they're no longer philosophers, don't forget. They, that's yeah. when they separated the two. They were taught a method. That's it. Shut up and calculate. I think that was the worst idea. It was a bad idea. <laughs> because now everything is me mechanics. 
everything is mechanical. If it's not mechanical, it's not part of it's it's beyond the, the scientific method, it doesn't exist. It's irrelevant. It's irrelevant. Whoa, whoa, wait a second. Your whole scientific method rests on these axioms. These axioms are metaphysical. Hmm. They're logic, they're philosophy. Your whole system, you, they're not seeing, you know, I love how Sean Carroll says it. He says, look, he's like, he was referring to quantum physics. He says, look, quantum physicists were like people with cell phones. We know how to use them. We don't know how they work. Science, you have to know how science works. We have to take you and and we have to cross-examine the, metaf the metaphysical principles behind them. They don't understand anything outside the metaphysical, excuse me, the scientific method itself. Now, the scientific method itself is not perfectly, uh, uh, it's not perfectly defined, but they understand the principles. Like, for instance, you mentioned Hassan ibn, ibn Haytham. He said, see for yourself, famously. It has to be repeatable. He gave you all the parameters of his, of his experiment. He had a hypothesis, made an experiment, and he says, test it for yourself. See for yourself, he wrote famously. It has to be repeatable. If it's not repeatable, I'll deny all my findings. If you can't repeat it, I'll deny all my findings. That's probably the, one of the most important pillars of the scientific method. Of course, you have control. You have all, all these other important elements. But why did they come up with these things? Because they used to be philosophers. They used to be thinkers. They used to think about epistemology. Now, you take out epistemology and you just give him a method. Well, guess what? He thinks that method is the end-all, be-all of everything. That's why you have men like Daniel Dennett saying, your consciousness is an illusion. Okay, well, Mr. Daniel, how did you come to that conclusion? He used his mind, but his mind is an illusion, so your conclusion is an illusion. How could your how could something that's illusionary come to a conclusion and it be true? It's a self-defeating position. They've they've completely shot themselves in the foot. Their reasons are absurd. Their excuse me, their their conclusions are absurd. And if he ever fell down and broke his leg, I would tell him it's an illusion. He would tell me, no, this is not an illusion. This pain is immediate. I feel it. I'm, I'm having a direct experience. Because he, he never studied philosophy at the highest levels. Berkeley said it best. He says, to be is to be perceived. If something is perceived, it exists. We can never deny this. If something has been perceived, I don't care if it's an optical illusion. It exists as an illusion. Things that don't exist are not perceived. If I perceive, perceive a mind, the mind exists. How it exists? Now that's the next door we have to open. But to deny, you know, it's it's incredible because the one thing he denies, i.e. the mind, is the one thing philosophers are sure exists. It's yeah. actually one of the most certain things. His conclusions are backwards. Philosophers, we make fun of his book. He's led to so many logical absurdities. Just because he cannot explain the mind, he decided to do away with it. It's a common problem with scientific thinkers they're so boxed into their thinking they don't understand the epistemology behind scientific thinking scientific scientific thinking is only to detect patterns that's it you detect the patterns when they try to interpret the whys they shoot themselves in the foot it's funny because I, I hear them say there is no why the, then you're explaining you're giving a why on why there's no why yes it's again self-defeating position we cannot hold true self-defeating positions they're contradictory we can yeah. never turn our backs on the country the, the, the principle of non contradiction. If you do, you're also turning your back on science. Science is not true. Listen, yeah. it's so important. We can never do away with the law of non contradiction. If we do, then science is not true. Science is one of the major axioms of science is the law of non contradiction. If your scientific experiment contradicts my scientific experiment, one of them is wrong. Yeah. Or they're both wrong. They cannot both be right. That is a fundamental axiom of science. There's no scientist in the world that says, well, your results are your results. My results are my results. It's all relative. No, there's, that, that, that's a, that flies in the face of science. Science is, is made to be as objective as possible. The more objective your experiments, the more scientific. The more, I'm going to say that again, okay? The more objective your scientific experiment, the more scientifically, the, the more scientific your experiment is. That's the whole point of science. Be as objective as possible. Take away subjectivity and relativism and all this stuff. How objective can we get? Yeah. How quantifiable can we get? That's what science is trying to do. But the thing is, they take it too far and they forget that subjectivity is also fundamental to our existence. It has its place. We cannot deny it. So every time they come in, every time they come in contact with something that's subjective, they do away with it. 
Absolutely. They just deny it because it doesn't fit. Yeah. It doesn't fit in their toolbox. Absolutely. And I love the way you always bring it back to the fact that scientists can't escape philosophy. And when they don't have a background in philosophy and they take and they make philosophical assumptions and deductions based upon what they're saying, and they think it's scientific when it's actually not. And we have to understand many, many in, in many fields, um, you will find that you will you simply cannot stay within the lane of science. You will eventually go into philosophy. So obviously cosmology is one example, uh, quantum mechanics you mentioned. So when there's a scientist who's talking about, um, okay, so there's different ways of interpreting quantum mechanics, uh, relational ensemble, information theories, Copernican, many worlds, whatever it is. Okay, so now if you're going to make statements like logic breaks down at the quantum level, no, 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 my friend. You're no longer doing science. You're actually doing philosophy because for you to even make that assumption that you can actually talk about, say, the law of non-contradiction, that that law of logic is broken down because of what you're observing. Well, you right now are not doing empiricism. You are actually using your metaphysical understanding to try and challenge something that we cannot say is sci is purely science. So, okay, fine, we can have that discussion if you believe the laws of logic break down at the quantum level. But what you cannot say is this is what science has concluded. So I think, uh, I think there's two things going on here. One is we have this uh, pompous attitude of some scientists who say philosophy is useless, right? Mm -hmm. People like Lawrence Krauss, you know, philosophy is dead. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, they're getting involved in philosophical discussions. It's the inescapable. Same thing. Right, it's inescapable. Is, is, a, philosoph a philosophical discussion is inescapable. Yes, yeah, when we yeah. try to tackle truth, it's inescapable. And what we find is, if you don't admit that you're uh, you're getting involved in ontological discussions, discussions about epistemology and and, mm -hmm. and these metaphysical discussions, you will do it badly. It's better for you to stop at that point and say, "Let me consult uh, a philosopher." And now someone may say, wait, wait a minute. Why do we need these navel gazing philosophers when, when we're scientists and, we, you know, we've done the experiments, we've done this, we've done that. Well, it's because if you're a scientist and you're studying uh, bacteria, you're, 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 you're staring at them through the microscope and you're studying them behind you. There's actually a philosopher and you're the bacteria for the philosopher. You're the bacterium. He's staring mm -hmm. at you. Exactly. You know, you're making interpretations based <laughs> upon that, that piece of evidence that you see. He's looking at you and how you're coming up with the conclusions that you're actually coming up with. So, you know, one of the one of the people I love in philosophy is Thomas Kuhn. Now, Thomas Kuhn, the reason why mm -hmm. I believe he was so successful is because he was a physicist. Right. Mm -hmm. So I think that's what gave him that insight. And absolutely. When when I see someone like him, I see a true 19th century. He was both a philosopher and a scientist. Yes. And I, I can bring you out quotes that will blow people's minds. What he, what he talks about when he talks about Newton and all that. He was a brilliant human being and most scientists will never understand him. I you, want your reaction to one thing which mm -hmm. uh, people find very controversial and people challenge him on. Uh, but I just wanted your honest perspective on this. Sure. He says that Essentially, um, when it comes to two different scientific paradigms, there's no objective way of deciding between the two of them. It's like a gestalt shift. It's like, you know, that picture of which looks like a rabbit or it looks like a woman uh, with, uh, with her face to the side. So he says there's no objective way to shift from one paradigm to another. And when you have one paradigm, then the um, the 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 phenomena in that particular paradigm makes sense within that paradigm mm -hmm. and the assumptions of that paradigm colors that data so say the definition of uh, mass is different in the newtonian uh, worldview than the einsteinian worldview right so um you, you get this complete different paradigm uh, sorry uh, space and time not um, uh, mass so space and time is a total different uh, 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 ontological reality in both one's absolute one's relative so he says there's no objective way of switching between one and two it's actually uh i mean one of the readings of, of kuhn is that it's an irrational decision to decide between one paradigm and another look I, i'm going to say something that i think most people might not understand and some might find strange but ultimately he's right and i'll tell you why because if you had the death of all paradigms 
you would have an experience called La ilaha illallah. La ilaha illallah is the death of all paradigms. Man is trapped within a paradigm at all times. If a man became so wise and so well trained, he could understand that when he lets go of all these paradigms, there's only one thing left. When all has perished, there's only one thing left. You're going to see the face of Allah. There will remain the face of God. Yes, paradigms are relative. They're subjective, etc. But also, holding that position itself is a paradigm. When you start to see paradigms for what they are, and you see them as dependent, they're contingent, you pierce through, and you can even have, you can have, because here's here's the thing, okay? Think about a time in your in, in your mother's womb, okay? You didn't have an ego. You didn't know about the external world, internal world. You didn't know about the mind. You didn't have a paradigm. What did, what experience, what state were you in? Well, according to our tradition, you are born upon the fitrah. Every child was born a Muslim. Not Muslim doesn't mean you know read the Quran or you followed Muhammad alayhi salam. Muslim means you are born upon the fitrah. It's the innate natural religion. You're having you have no paradigm. But there, there's a further, there's a higher step than that. At that point, you were just a you were just a point of awareness, and there was no I'm a point of awareness, and there was no locality, and there was no all these things that we adopted today as hard facts. You were having an innate experience. There was no you. There was no I. There was just this oneness. It was beyond every paradigm and when you were born in this world all these paradigms came flushing through now you've been you've been in you're, you're put in the dunya now you start to develop an ego there's me there's the world uh there's my friends there's this way of thinking there's that way of thinking there's pain there's suffering i'm learning all these things about the world however i was born upon the fitrah so i tell you there is no human being that came in this earth that wasn't born upon the fitrah we had an experience of this oneness and our whole job in, in this world you know when you pray when you say Allahu Akbar it's it's symbolically you're throwing the entire dunya behind you when you pray there's only Allah there's only God you're not thinking about what I'm doing later you're not thinking about what time I woke I woke up late for work you're not thinking you shouldn't be thinking about anything you should be when you do when you make your salah like you're standing before Allah and even you should get to the point where you, you're not aware of yourself anymore there's only this one, you know, I always tell people, you know, within us, there's a there's a point of awareness. Even the concept of within or without, that's that's also paradigm. Mm -hmm. Flush that, flush it all. What are you going to be left with? One Muslim thinker said it in an interesting way. He, he gave the floating man experiment. Mm -hmm. And he talked about, look, what if you were hanging? Like, it's not a perfect, it, it's not a perfect analogy. No, no analogy is perfect, but he was pointing at something. And I think I think his analogy was good. It wasn't great. Because there's no analogy they can, there is no analogy. There is nothing in the dunya that we can point to and say, that's what we're talking about. Yeah. It's not part of the dunya. It's not part of the, you can't put it in a test tube. So, but we all have a direct experience with it. I know it, it's, it kind of sounds weird, but try to think about the state you were in before you were in the dunya. There was a time where you didn't know about. Sabur, you didn't know about England and Canada, you didn't have sensory experience, you didn't hear things, but there was awareness, mm. there was existence. You have to cut through all you have to cut through all the paradigms, all the emergence. What are you gonna find? You think there's still gonna be the one. Okay, that's why one Muslim thinker put it that way. It's like imagine you were hanging. Imagine you had no sensory experience. Is there still something left? Yes, there's still something left. And the whole the whole dunya, all of existence comes from this. Not it, it's not within us. We are within it. We are not, we are not containing. It, 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 there's no analogy to give, but every human being has had this experience. That's why the Quran tells us: look, before you came into this world, Allah asked you, Who is your Lord? And we all give shahada. Mm. If you talk to a blind man about the color red, he doesn't know what you're talking about. He might believe you that you're experiencing red, but he's like, look, I hear that there's this thing called sight, but I have no idea what you're talking about when you say the color red. Mm. I could talk to him about red bicycles and red homes and red apples. He doesn't, even though he's super intelligent, even though he's super scientific, one day they fix his eyes and he sees the color red and he's like, wow, 
everything you told me in the past makes sense. You guys can differentiate items by colors. I didn't know the color red. I heard about it. I understood that you there was a property, but I had no cons I had nothing to associate the word red with. Hmm. Human beings, when we talk to them about God, they never say what's God. And never they never act like a blind man when you talk to them about the color red. All human beings had a direct experience with Allah. Like a, only if I talk to you about the color red, you're like, yeah, I know what you're talking about. If I talk to you about an experience you have you have never had, and you you haven't had an experience that's like it. So, for instance, let's say I rode a bike, and somebody tells me about riding a unicycle. I could kind of say, look, a unicycle and a bike is kind of the same thing. No, I'm talking to you about God. I'm talking about the divine. You've never seen anything divine in the dunya yet. When I talk to you about the divine, you know what I'm talking about. Yeah, you've had a direct experience with the divine, whether you admit to it or not. Because we cannot talk about what doesn't exist. Every logician will agree to this. I always tell people, you know, look, look, yes, Santa Claus doesn't exist. Nobody believes in Santa Claus. But all the things that make up Santa Claus, you know, we've talked about this in the past. Mm -hmm. All the properties of Santa Claus exist. You can make a collage. That's why I tell people, you know, I don't believe in Zeus because Zeus is the idea of God and the idea of lightning and they married it together and then they have the, the God of lightning. That's why the Quran says, don't partner anything up with the idea of God. You're already, you're, it's inborn, it's innate. You know God, but don't, don't take this precious experience and mix it with anything else. Some people are infatuated with love. Okay, they, they pray to the God of love. No, this is, a, this is an abomination. Yeah. You know, you know don't um, mix ideas. Simple ideas all are only known through direct experience. That's why I, I've never asked, I never talked to an atheist about God, and he's like, What is this thing you talk? I, 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 yeah. I have yeah. no comprehension whatsoever. No, no, they all like, yeah, they, they they throw the ball back. They're playing ball with me. I say, okay, well, you have experience. Well, love. Yeah. It's psychology. It's not logic. They're just as logical as everybody else. It's yeah. psychology. Yeah. Yeah, and I, I love the way you took it back to when Ghazali, Imam Ghazali, to, uh, when he broke everything down, it just went back to the base level of La ilaha illallah. I mean, the, the, there's something I just wanted to point out because it's so important for our uh, listeners to understand how important Ghazali was for not only Islamic history, but Western philosophy. So there's a paper I recently came across of Christopher Hurtado, um, uh, Ghazali and uh, Descartes correlation or causation. So what's interesting about this is Ghazali is obviously from the 12th century, Descartes from the 17th century. Mm -hmm. Ghazali is dealing with two primary problems in philosophy. How do you acquire knowledge and how is it justified? And they, I mean, in, in the paper, Christopher uh, is arguing that they, they come upon the same conclusion, obviously 500 years apart approximately. Mm -hmm. Descartes was influenced by Ghazali. Now, this is important. No no doubt. When you when you're doing you you did philosophy, uh, you did a philosophy degree as well, and so did mm -hmm. I. And we both know how important Descartes is in philosophy. You go He's modern the, philosophy. Yeah, he is. They start uh, modern philosophy with Descartes. Yeah, exactly. That's where modern yeah. philosophy starts. But guess what? He wrote exactly what Ghazali wrote. He had the same yes. experience. Like he doubted everything. Ghazali had a crisis. Descartes had a crisis. Yes. I think it's very likely. They saw the Islamic world. Islamic world was very famous at the time. They collected their books. The Islamic empire crumbled. They collected their books. They collected their libraries. They had it. In, they had it translated. And for sure, there's there's no doubt about it. Look, there, there's too many similarities. Hmm. And what, what's important is if you if you look through this um, ChristopherHurtado.com, you, you're going to find he's written this uh, th this article about this is. Nobody, nobody can deny that Islamic philosophy, Islamic scientists, whatever you want to call it, a lot of this information was getting through and then it was being filtered and Europeanized in a way that people were saying, oh, this particular thinker is the original, uh, this is his original work, when clearly it's not, mm -hmm. unless we want to say... Um, there's some sort of uh, uh, convergence going on where these Islamic thinkers came to this conclusion and then it was a dead end. Mm -hmm. Nobody spoke about them. No one read their work. The Europeans didn't know about them. And then a few centuries later, the Europeans hit upon the same conclusion. Isn't it more likely that those same European thinkers who were sharing the manuscripts with the other parts of the world and 
they were getting information which we know directly for sure that they did get from the Islamic world, which they admitted to. And then there's other philosophical ideas which are also coming through. Um, one of the um, one of the first scientists, no, in fact, the first scientist in the UK was Adelaide of Bath. Now, Adelaide of Bath, when he went over to Islamic Spain, you know, he saw the Arabs as the masters of reason. And mm-hmm. look at how Orientalists saw the Arabs, you know, as backward. And so you, what we find is that they had this respect for the Islamic world. They had this absolutely each of the Islamic world. And I just want to highlight something which may seem not that important, but I really do think it's important. They used to go there and feel inferior to mm-hmm. the Arabs. Mm-hmm. And they used to put on the Arab garb. Because that made them feel more intellectual. It made them feel uh, more like part of a civilization. Mm -hmm. And likewise, what we find is that not only, you know, and this is, I, I think, a huge misunderstanding. Not only is it the case that we have the classical narrative that Ghazali brought down science, which is absolute nonsense, because the peak of it is the Islamic uh, science was even after Ghazali. Mm-hmm. But that we had an independent Ottoman science after the uh, the supposed uh, uh, golden uh, era, because the golden era didn't end at the time that they say it ended. And you also had a Mughal science, which was going on independently. And what I would also say is look at the Muslim, uh, Muslim uh, immigrants in the first and the second and the third generations that are coming to the West. Are they running away from science? Or do no. you find so many Muslims involved in science mm-hmm. in the Western world because they don't have access to that information. They don't mm-hmm. have access to that information in the Muslim world. And what you will find is even as Muslim uh, uh, Muslim uh, societies are now starting to uh, thrive in the West, what you're finding is that a revival of not only the, the, the Muslims during the golden era, that we are looking to them for inspiration, we are also acknowledging the work of the Europeans. We're also acknowledging the work of the Greeks. So I, as, we I should, say, as we should, as we should. So I believe, um, you know, Muslims are giving credit to the Europeans for the, the, for the developments that they actually did. But what we find is that that same um, acknowledgement is not being done for what the Muslims actually did. And that asymmetry is painful. It's painful to see, you know, oh, it's only us. You know, when, when Sam Harris says, you know, uh, all of these fantastic developments only came from, um, you know, the, the the Western world. And Muslims were just fixing calendars and you, just very crude way of <laughs> crude way of, of, of trying to. Um, now, I want him to explain why they're called Arabic numerals, even though they hail from India. The Arabs had mastered ma- ma- these nu- numerals, this numeral system. People associated with the Arabs because the Arabs were the best mathematicians. I would love for him to explain to me why they're called Arabic numerals. Like, why does the world know what is an Arabic numeral? You know, yeah. like, it's called Greco-Roman wrestling because the Greeks were really good at it. You know, like, the, wrestling was probably older than the Greeks, probably hails from India, actually. But the Greeks made it famous. You know, like, you master something. Like, we call it Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. Jiu-Jitsu hails from Japan. We call it Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu because the, the Brazilians took over at one point. They made it famous. They did it better and they took it further. It's undeniable. But why do they want to deny it? Because they want to say, look, we're the champions of the world. We're the champions of history. And I find it absurd. And the thing is, I would say even Muslims sometimes have a bad attitude towards the Greeks. You know, oh, no, don't listen to anything the Greeks says. No, no, the Greeks had a lot of good things to say. They had a lot of bad things to say, but also a lot of good things to, they, to say. We take the good, we leave the bad. That's it. Logic is for everyone. And especially the Muslims. You should love logic. If it's because the thing is, they think philosophy means witchcraft or something. No, philosophy is formal logic. Do you think formal logic is haram? If so, why don't you make arithmetic haram? Why don't you make mathematics haram? Why don't we make calculus haram? Let's make science. Like, it's, it's, it's an absurdity to say that. Blind following I mean, blind following of Aristotle? Yeah, that I agree is haram. That's, that's yeah. haram. But that's what Ghazali was referring to. He wasn't referring to all of logic. No, he wasn't. And, you know, you spoke about mathematics and how important mathematics is, you know, for just the Islamic society to actually function. Mathematics is the purest type of philosophy you're going to get, which mm-hmm. is why one of the best philosophers, most well-known philosophers of the 20th century, Bertrand Russell, was mm-hmm. a mathematician. Mm-hmm. Uh, William Dembski, who I'm going to be interviewing tomorrow, is a mathematician mm-hmm. and a philosopher. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, you, you spoke about um how credit is, is not given. And one of the things that came to mind is it's not just to do with the Islamic world when it comes to this uh, European-centric whitewashing, uh, when it comes to knowledge. And this is something, by the way, Pat- Patricia Farah points out to uh, as well. It's 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 also with respect to other civilizations. So, for example, 
um, for almost 2000 years, the idea in philosophy is knowledge is true justified belief. Right. Mm -hmm. There's this basic idea. Right right? Edmund Gettier came along and he smashed that. Right. Mm -hmm. He showed how you can have something. Uh, you could, the Gettier problem essentially yeah. something can be true. A broken clock is right two times a day, but it's not exactly. giving you the right time on purpose. It's, 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 so you, yeah. you believe it to be true. Uh, so you believe you it and it's true, but you're not, but you're not justified, right? right? It's not but perfect. You know, JTP is not is not perfect. Yeah. So what's interesting is I found out the Gettier problem was not discovered in the 60s. Mm. The, the, the challenge to true justified belief actually goes back all the way to the Indian civilization approximately mm. two something thousand years ago. Mm. I, 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 I don't remember the name of the Indian philosopher, but what what we have to understand is that history did not begin in the 15th century. No. They were great thinkers in the Indus Valley civilization. They were great thinkers amongst the Greeks. L look at what the um, the Aztecs achieved, right? So I think one of the problems is it's not just to do with Islam for us. It's to do with the with a mindset where the Europeans, uh, some certain thinkers, they want uh, the world to believe all good actually came from the Greeks. And then what happened during the Enlightenment period, as if nothing was achieved by the Egyptians, nothing was achieved by uh, <laughs> yeah, it's the, incredible. The, the Mayans, right? So there, there's something deeper here. Absolutely. And I, look, it's... I, look, I, I love white people. I have no racism whatsoever. Oh, but yes, yes. White people have only been here for 6,000 years. Uh, the white people have been here for only 6,000 years. Now, I know human history hasn't been recorded that long, but we can't say innovation started 6,000 years ago. Like Human beings have been building civilizations for longer than that. Okay, We have innovations. We have, uh, you know, the past is hazy. Yes, uh, it's not that easy to figure out, but there was a lot of great thinkers in the past and they were not all white Europeans. Now, there's a really good book called Germs, White... Uh, sorry, Guns, Germs, and Steel, that kind of explains why Europe had such success. And because, you know, he, he, there's actually a really interesting documentary on, on his book. He actually goes to New Guinea and he's like, in the New Guinean environment, I wouldn't last one day. He was a white European. And he's like, but these guys have innovated so much, so much. They've innovated so many techniques and tools to live in this environment. They were brilliant. But he's saying, he noticed that they spend about 10 hours a day just gathering the calories they need to stay alive. So he realized that, hey, Europe had farming. Europe has beasts of burden. He relates it to guns, germs, and steel also at the end. They landed in a place where it was calories were more abundant. Certain cultures had to work 10, 12 hours. You know, Greeks also had slavery. They say, scholars say, because they had slaves, they could sit around and think. They didn't have to go till the soil eight hours a day, 12 hours a day. They had a slave system. If it wasn't for their slave system, fertile lands, etc., they wouldn't have reached this, they wouldn't have had the leisure time to study philosophy, math, history, science, etc. Yeah. So there's so much involved to success. Now, the Arabs were successful, the Asians were successful, the whites were successful, the Africans were successful at a certain point. But it has a lot to do with our environment. You know, the Quran tells us God chooses who's going to be the next uh, successor, who's going to be the next rising civilization. Go out in the land and see all the civilizations that, ro that rise and fall. There's reasons why they rise and there's reasons why they fall. Europe is having its day in the sun. How long will it last? Time will tell. You know, it's very interesting you say that. And just before I go back to uh, the Huberman clip, there's one point I wanted to point out about this. You know, you spoke about environmental influence. Right. This was, I mean, a clear example of this is what happened with Alfred Russell Wallace. So Alfred Russell Wallace was younger than Darwin. Uh, and at, at the time, just before the publication of The Origin of Species, um, he actually uh, came up with a natural selection as a mechanism before Darwin went public. And then they mm -hmm. presented it in, in 1858. Um, at the Royal Society, so they they did this together. Now this is linked to uh, you know uh, environment and how how human beings can act in a certain environment. Now what happened was natural selection being the explanation for biological systems for 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 life for, for all of life essentially was something being pushed by Wallace and Darwin, and this is why it was known as Wallace and Darwin's theory. Now what happened was. <laughs> Alfred Russell Wallace committed intellectual apostasy 
of natural selection because of what you're saying, because he noted if you take somebody from South America, you mm. take somebody in an environment in which they're basically just surviving. They just don't have time to do anything except survive. Those people who he interacted with, once those people, he said, are brought over here to the UK, they study in Cambridge, they're just as smart as us. Mm -hmm. So what happened with, with him is he started to doubt the efficacy of natural selection mm -hmm. as an explanation. So what he did is he said natural uh, selection cannot explain the human mind. Now, Darwin, um, and, and this is this is really fantastic. Uh, Michael Shermer, who is a well-known uh, mm -hmm. skeptic, he actually yeah. did his PhD on um, uh, Alfred Russell Wallace. Right. Mm -hmm. I mean. He, he in one of his lectures he talks about this and there's not not a lot of information so he's a he's a credible authority on uh, Alfred Russell Wallace and uh, Darwin said to him don't murder our child like we're both here talking about natural selection and now you've committed this intellectual apostasy a lot mm. of people don't know he started to refer to some form of higher intelligence some non-material source mm -hmm. for the human mind why did this happen this happened because he believed the human mind of somebody in South America is just as intelligent as the human mind of someone in Europe. Why is that a problem for natural selection? Because you are only supposed to be as cognitively optimized as required by your environment for survival mm -hmm. and reproduction. Mm -hmm. So why is it that you take someone in South America who's just supposed to be in a hunter-gatherer society and they have the cognitive ability of a graduate of Cambridge? That is an anomaly for evolutionists to try and explain, for Darwinists to try and explain. So, you know, th this thing is, is, is linked to the Eurocentric view of history. Even at the apex of, of the European uh, intellectual conquest of the world, the, the 19th century and the early 20th century, because Alfred Russell Wallace lived up till uh, 1909, I believe. Um, what do we find? We find that actually these great European thinkers, um, Alfred Russell Wallace was referred to as the last great Victorian or whatever he was. They even realized this is not true. We are not the best. And, you know, Darwin, I'm not sure if you know about this, but Darwin believed uh, um, uh, Caucasians to be the, mm -hmm. the highest evolved. Yeah. And he believed now, this is this is really interesting. This is really, really interesting. He, he wrote this in The Descent of Man. Uh, and um, th th there's a few other places he refers to this as well, that um, he believes the English to be the best amongst the Caucasians from an evolutionary perspective. And here's his justification, because they are the best at colonization. They know how to get the best out, best out of other human beings. So what we have to realize is there's a lot of psychology involved when it comes to mm -hmm. Darwinism. There's a lot of European-centric whitewashing of history when it when it comes to science in general. So when me and you, Faraz, when we're talking about, say, uh, faith and, uh, you know, philosophy, we, we can't dissect that uh, in a clean way away from history and psychology no, because there's a lot of those things mm. which are, are are playing into these types of discussions because look at the end of the day human beings are human beings we're dealing with people that want to say we are the greatest civilization that's ever existed and one of the lessons from the quran that we get is that you know civilizations they come and go you know, Allah mm -hmm. says that he knows who came before you, who will come after you, you know, and, and there are people in the past who used to build into, uh, you know, stone valleys. They used to build, you know, high rise buildings. They used to have all these sophisticated things. And where are they today? Mm -hmm. You know, I was talking to um, mm -hmm. somebody who's, you know, a really keen, avid um, uh, reader of history. And he's talking to me about some empire. Uh, I've, I've forgotten the name and it was supposed to be a huge empire um, going back some, uh, I think even before the Romans. And I said, I've never heard of it. And he was so shocked. And it, and it just made me think as well, they were empires which were huge in the past. And today we don't even know about them. Mm -hmm. So, you know, me and you for us, we are just at a point in history in 2023, 500 years from now, people are not going to be remembering the Western civilization. The Western civilization will just be another blip. It could be from Latin America, could be from Africa, could be from mm -hmm. Asia, could be from any part of the world. Yeah, exactly. They think that, you know, I, I don't know if you're familiar. Well, I'm sure you're familiar with uh, Abraham Maslow's hierarchy of yes. needs. Yes. But, yes. you know, he, he rewrote it after. Yes. Because the, the so you have, uh, you know, 
shelter, warmth, water, food. Then you have uh, security. Then you know you you need to excel in your in your society. You need to, you need to be an important member of society. Then self actualization. Self actualization is like if you have the ability to become a black belt, you you did it. If you have the ability to become a PhD in mathematics, you 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 actualize all your potential. He rewrote his pyramid later. Yeah. He said it's not satisfactory. He said you need self transcendence. What's the point of being the greatest civilization if we're just going to die in the earth? You you got so enamored with your success. You you became so about yourself. You became the Pharaoh. That's why the, the story of Pharaoh is so important in the Quran. He became so enamored with himself. He's so great. He's so amazing. Then he gets buried in the sea. This is a gift from God. Be grateful. Mm. Share with your father. Do something good because you're going to end up buried in the sea or in the dirt like every other man. But they became so enamored with themselves. It's pride. That's why pride is a sin. Instead mm -hmm. of feeling gratitude, they think it's from their own doing. It's not from their own doing. It's not. Mm -hmm. That's why money can be a curse. If you think it's your own doing, oh, I'm so smart. I invested in the right way. That's all a blessing you received. But now you've turned it into a curse. That's the paradigm in, in the Islamic world. When something comes your way, you have to interpret it as good. This is, what the, this is God's plan for you. I'm going to interpret it as good. And I'm going to be grateful for it. This is the Muslim paradigm. However, if you have success in life and you think it's from your own doing, you will never, you're going to lose your connection with God because you're so, enamored. it's about me now. It's about myself. Where self-transcendence, if you want to go at the highest level of human experience, this is what Abraham Maslow, the father of psychology, he says, look, you have to connect with something beyond yourself. That's why, if when we pray five times a day is because you're connecting with something beyond yourself. You know, there was a study on life satisfaction. Yeah. Not happiness, life satisfaction. You know what the highest, the group of the, I'm going to send you the study after, after we hang up. Okay. So maybe you can put in the, in the, in the description, the highest level of life satisfaction was the Muslim people. You know, you know what gives you life satisfaction? The sense of belonging, unity, the lowest was the atheist, believe it or not. <laughs> no, sir, I'm, I'm dead serious. Least life satisfaction. Mm. The highest was the Muslim. Look at the Muslim, look at the Muslim world. When we go to Mecca, we all pray in, in synchrony. Mm. Every race, every class of uh, society, all praying together in harmony. How amazing is that? The unity be Finally, racism is dead. The one place in the world where racism, racism is dead, at the, you know, Malcolm X, he says, look, when he went to Mecca, he couldn't believe how Islam solved the problem of racism. And, you know, he, he wrote famously that all, all mankind snores the same, you know, before he was nation of Islam, then he converted to his, uh, Orthodox Islam, Sunni Islam. The sense of belonging, the, self, the sense of self-transcendence, it's, the, the, our existence is more important than our daily lives. You start seeing heaps of money as not as important. You start seeing uh, empires as not as important. Yeah, today you're rich and powerful. Tomorrow you're dead in the dirt like the rest of us. There's something more important than than having this, uh, li uh, this these these certain um, superficial life experiences. You know, that's a very clear segue into what Huberman was saying and we can go back to playing his clip because that's what materialism is telling us materialism mm -hmm. is telling us okay it's just about getting xyz and our feelings right our existential crises that we have is telling us there has to be something more and when the people yearn for something and they live according to a life that is the belief in a transcendent god then their lives are happier. How do they explain that from a Darwinian perspective? How do they explain the yearning? Mm -hmm. How do they explain mm -hmm. the, the behavior of, because, uh, you know, um, uh, what, what, one of the things that I was researching a few years back, and I, you don't need to research it too much to in order to understand what, what a huge problem it is. It's religion from a Darwinian perspective. How on earth are you going to explain that, the, as uh, Richard Dawkins says in Selfish Gene, the highest uh, ultimate rationale of life is survival and reproduction. Mm -hmm. So you have these 
self-replicators, these immortal genes, and uh, essentially we're vehicles and it's all about the genes. Mm -hmm. Why are we building you know, these religious buildings? Why are we trying to connect with the divine? Why are people becoming celibate? Why where's the it... gene? Where's the gene for that? Yeah, yeah, yeah why exactly. would there be a gene for that? Exactly. Um, and if anything, if anything, human beings are more likely, and this is this is not just according to me and you know, me and Faraz just coming up with random stuff. Look at what anthropologists are saying, right? Human beings yearn meaning, hunter-gatherer societies meaning mm -hmm. meaning and values and morality and all these types of things which are not things which are going to help you survive and reproduce they're actually barriers to that they're actually constraints to that they actually can get in the way of your survival and reproduction those are super important human civilization and human civilization thrives not when you have this hobbesian type of uh, every man versus another man and life is short brutish and nasty it's actually when people cooperate when they live in a, a symbiotic way, when they live in a way that's self-sacrificial. And what we find from the life of even social insects, right? What we find from the life of even social insects is that, you know, there is a, a tendency in even insects to do things for the colony, mm -hmm. to do things for um, their, their fellow insects. So even whether we look at social insects, whether we look at plants, whether we look at human beings, we do not find that individual level selection that they talk about. We do not find that base level selfishness. What we find instead is that people want to work for the collective. People want to work for something greater. And the funny thing here for us is even the New Atheist Movement, which started with Richard Dawkins' book, uh, The God Delusion, their call was not for survival and reproduction. Their call was, again, an egalitarian societal mm -hmm, call, mm -hmm. which, which again, flies in the face of their whole uh, <laughs> uh, their whole the whole worldview you know if, if if the world is survival and reproduction why shouldn't i step on everybody's head and, and survive and reproduce and take all the women for myself no that wouldn't make us happy i'd be miserable no i'm, I'm our lives are richer when we live together in, in community yes I would, I would i would i like to ask you like think think about this okay you're thirsty there's water you're hungry there's food Look at the pyramid. Oh, you need shelter? There's shelters. Like every desire you have, every need you have, there's 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 the there's something out there to quench it. You want security? Well, we have systems of security. Every need you have, every single human need or desire, there's a way to satisfy that need. The Quran says for every uh hardship, there is a relief. I have this desire. I'm the only we're the only creatures on earth that want to live forever like i'm hungry i was a little baby i was fed i was cold they, 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 every need i have every discomfort was somehow some way it had a relief there's a relief out there you also have this discomfort that you know you're gonna die but you don't want to die you don't want this to be the end it would be meaningless if it was so we we thirst for meaning do you think this is the time now there won't be a counterpart to satisfy that meeting? Everything has a has a counterpart. Everything, every need is satisfied except this one. The Quran talks about this. It says, do you think this is going to be for nothing? You have this need inside you like you had every need. Think about this, okay? The human being is very unique. When you're born, you're not like a, like a, like a baby gazelle who gets up and starts walking around grazing. No, 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 no. You, you can't even turn your head. You will die if somebody doesn't take care of you. Yes or no? Yeah, Every yeah. human being was brought to was kept alive with either pity or love. Pity is just another form of love. <laughs> somebody, somebody fed you. Somebody changed you. Somebody yeah. kept you warm. You would have died on your own. Yeah. Every need you have was satisfied. The Quran is telling you, look, you have this other need. Mm -hmm. You have this connection. You have this desire to connect with me. I'm telling you, I'll be here. I am the firmest handhold. Like it was in the past, it will be again in the future. The Quran is always asking us, think about the cycles. Think about the what happened in the past. It's going to happen again in the future. You have these desires. I've satisfied them all. You have this other desire for meaning. It will also be satisfied. There is a meaning to life. If not, why would we have this desire? Yeah. How could this desire exist? So I, I really feel like if you think about the world we live in, well, atheists have, have it also another problem is that, okay, 
Enjoy life. Oh, don't worry about death and life. Just enjoy life. Okay, so you you like fancy foods, you like fancy cars, you like fancy women, you like fancy trips. All of a sudden, you get old. Now, the body used to enjoy so much. Now it's a torture chamber. You have to go to the doctor. You need these procedures. You can't digest these foods. You can't have the, these certain trips. And now you're getting old. Your, your body, which you enjoyed so much, was your amusement park. Now is a torture chamber. Why? Because now you're only thinking about the things you can't have. Human beings grow. They go through different phases. And I'm telling you guys all as a friendly uh, advice, make sure you have a spiritual, uh, you develop your spiritual side. It's very important because the body will soon become a prison. If you don't have the spiritual side developed, if you don't take the next step, you'll be left behind in a, in a torture chamber. And your torture chamber will be your body, my friend. Believe me, your body, when you develop your spiritual side when you develop a connection with god you're happy the body's decaying you're happy the time is almost up this chamber is i'm almost out of this i'm going to be connected again with allah in, in a more uh, intimate way then you're looking forward to the end in so many ways absolutely as the prophet ﷺ said death is gift it's a gift to the believer you know? alhamdulillah um i'm going to go back and play his mm -hmm. clip and yet Oh, so real. Yeah. So, you know, I mean, we could talk a bit about how I, you know, well, I'll just say this. Secretly, I've always prayed. I grew up in a split religion home. My yeah. family's like the UN. We've got people from Guatemala, <laughs> uh, Denmark, Argentina, New York, like all the different political battles are in my family. It's super left, super right, libertarians, mm -hmm. lefties to the, you know, yeah. it's crazy. Uh, Thanksgivings can be difficult. Yeah. But I'll say this, you know, I, I absolutely pray. Mm -hmm. I absolutely love that the idea, but also what for me is really a deep belief, which is that we can't control everything. We're not in as much control as we think we are. And that the magnificence of biology and the magnificence of, of nature is um, it, it's, imp it's impossible to, for me to conceive how that could be come about any other way. It just is now. Yeah, I mean, I think that, you know, full stop. You know, that thing about control that he said is very interesting. What's your thoughts on that? We're not in control. No, we're not in control. Honestly, I, remember, I've, I've talked to you about my views on compatibilism. I think everything we try to do or decide is out of our control. Only, uh, only God controls every single thing. It's only will you accept. It's only your attitude towards what happens that matter that 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 you have control over. We have free will, but only in this sense. I mean, I don't want to go through it all again because we've done it in the past, and I'm sure we'll do it again in the future. But I'm 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 a hard determinist, but I also believe in free will. Often it's often referred to as compatibilism, but I, I totally agree because if determinism is not true, nothing makes sense. You know, so he's 100 percent right. I can't see it any other way. Existence can't just happen because if that was the case, if existence just happened for no good reason, then you could explain, be consistent. You could explain everything like that yeah. and anything like that. If you believe in science, math, and logic, you also believe in God. If you don't, it's psychology. It's not logic and math and, and science that brought you there. It's your psychology. Mm -hmm. Shaitan dialogued with Allah and he's called, he, the devil dialogues with God and he's called a disbeliever. It was psychology, his problem. He says to God, give me respite. He believes in the power of God. He believes, but he didn't want to submit to God. Mm -hmm. He didn't believe that this is the path to success. He believed there was another path he can take. That's what he disbelieved in. He didn't disbelieve in the, in the existence of God. God is a given. It's, it's a glaring, obvious truth. No human can deny it. And using science to deny God is, the, is a very weak and self-contradictory and feeble, only the most feeble-minded thinkers, logicians, not scientific thinkers. You could be a great scientific thinker and know nothing about logic and, 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 and philosophy. It's weak philosophy. It, in my opinion, it's incredible psychology. If you look at David Hume's, David Hume, he has a, he's a, most people consider him an atheist, even though he didn't explicitly say it. If you read his books, you can read between the lines. He's definitely an atheist. He, you know, he, his his books are dialogues, so they're having dialogues. One person believes in God, one person doesn't. They're having a dialogue. At the end of the book, he's saying, "Look, you might have, you might be, 
it might be true there's a God, but not the Christian God. So he, that's where he leaves it. It's like, okay, maybe there is a God, but you give him a lot of good arguments that there is a God, but it's not maybe not the Christian God. And you could see that, look, he has that attitude of enlightenment thinkers who are who are angry with Christianity. The truth is they're pissed off with Christianity. That's why there's so much atheism today. They're angry with Christianity. People don't understand. Science doesn't bring you away from uh, God. It doesn't. It brings you towards God. However, the Christians, sorry, the Enlightenment thinkers had a distaste with Christianity. And they associate Islam and Judaism and all the other religions with the same thing. They're the same as Christianity. Because if you look at the golden age of Islam, they loved science and they loved religion. The two went hand in hand and there was no dispute. Uh, it's more psychology. You can see David Hume is angry with Christianity. But I mean, these, these are like small circle conversations. Most people, they don't know that, that, that history and they don't know much about David Hume. And when you try to explain to them, look, in my opinion, David Hume was a very intelligent guy. He was not deficient in, in, in logic. And, yeah. and, and, and he, 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 me and him, I probably will hold a very similar views, except I think he doesn't explicitly say it, but he's an atheist. Yeah. And I think it's more to do with psychology. Yeah. Definitely. And you know, you, you spoke about um, using science as one of the ways of, uh, you know, challenging religion is one or, or theology is one of the weakest things you can do. Something that came to mind in this context is, um, you know, people like Huberman are always speaking about, uh, you know, dopamine, serotonin, oxytocin and all this stuff. There are studies that show religious behavior, religious belief. It actually activates these chemicals. It activates the same neural systems. Why is that? If we are the product of a blind naturalistic process that's geared towards survival and reproduction, why actions that are detrimental for your survival and reproduction? Instead of praying to God, you should be hunting. So your brain is rewarding you for actions to do with the transcendent, to do with this uh, thing which they believe does not exist. God does not exist. But you are rewarded for that. And, you know, something I find interesting about Huberman, what he says here, is that you always prayed. Now, mm -hmm. human beings, we pray. This is just part of our nature. <clears throat> I remember meeting uh, somebody a few years ago. Um, who was a classical um, atheist. He, he wasn't brought up in a household with religion. He didn't have the concept of God at home. His family, his parents were atheists. He was an atheist. And he said, I got into trouble once and I got into this terrible situation and I prayed to God. And he said something happened and he started believing in God. Mm -hmm. He's not a Christian, not a Muslim. At that point that I met him, he just believed in God because of what happened. Mm -hmm. Now, this experience for us got me thinking that Clearly, you believed you were an atheist. You believed you were raised in an atheistic household. But when you prayed to God, where was the rational arguments for the existence of God? Design argument, cosmological contingency? No, nothing. You instantly, in a point of distress, called upon God. And you prayed, and that prayer for you was natural. Same thing the Quran says. You know, when people are on a ship, they're in this form of mm -hmm. distress. They mm -hmm. call out to God. What we find time and time again is that this fitra, this innate nature is coming out. So when you have somebody like Huberman, who from a from a materialistic point of view, he's famous, he's handsome, mm -hmm. uh, he's wealthy, he's he's got he's got his know, health. He's got his very he's you know, he's very healthy, he's got his reputation, he's got a growing YouTube channel. Why is he now putting his neck on the chopping board mm -hmm. and speaking about religion? Because he's actually committing a heresy now. Mm -hmm. He's going to get targeted. Mm -hmm. We know, for example, to, uh, you know, just to show you how e how evil the, this world of um, uh, this da this Darwinistic atheistic influence on science is. Um, Dembski, who I'm going to be interviewing tomorrow, he wrote the book The Design Inference, which Cambridge University was happy to print. Is mm. happy to print, and. As soon as, and remember, he he's somebody with two PhDs, he's an academic. As soon as he wanted to write the next book, which is to apply that theoretical, because you know he he he's um he's published on randomness and he's he's done a lot of fantastic work on the design argument, stuff which is so philosophically original and unique that it was it was selling like hotcakes for Cambridge, mm -hmm. right? 
as soon as he said, okay, I'm going to take this explanatory filter. So he has this design filter where something, um, you know, if, it, if it's not... Um, uh, either it's contingent or not, and then it's complex or it's not, or it's specified or it's not, and therefore it's designed, and he has this entire system. As soon as he wanted to apply that to biological systems, that was it. Mm -hmm. Cambridge wanted nothing to do with him. He couldn't even publish a second version of the same book that's already been published with Cambridge. So someone like Huberman is committing intellectual uh, suicide in terms of his career. And this is what Dembski says, that everything went downhill for him as soon as he wanted to take his design explanatory, uh, the, the design inference and apply it to, bi to, to biology, right? So we know of many, many different cases where academics, as soon as they, uh, as soon as they cross the line uh, from uh, uh, sticking to the Darwinian narrative, sticking to the atheistic narrative, to starting to openly speak about God, this is when they are in trouble. So what is Huberman's, and I want everyone to just uh, ask this question, what is Huberman's self-interest in talking about this? He's not going to get more famous by talking no, about this. No. He's going to put his career at Stanford, I believe he is, in jeopardy. Um, he could lose a lot of followers. But mm -hmm. faith is so powerful that he's know. willing to put those things essentially at risk and talk about something that he feels you can see it. You can see it in his face. He really believes in God. Mm -hmm. He says full stop. Mm -hmm. Right. Good for he him. says there's no other yeah. explanation. He's very categorical. He's not being probabilistic or inductive. Mm -hmm. He's being very categorical and deductive. So, you know, what is the incentive? And it's the power of faith. The power of faith will make you do things which will go against your self-interest. Okay, so, so let's let's do a little thought experiment, okay? Well, maybe it's not a thought experiment. Think, think about this, okay? Once upon a time, there was matter, right? Sticks and stones bouncing around chaotically. This is what they tell us. That matter, at one point, was being moved by these forces chaotically. At one point, that matter started to replicate itself. And then after that, that matter, sticks and stones, uh, because we ask, we ask scientists, is there special matter out there? Is there like some kind of magic? No, 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 it's all the same. Everything that makes up the universe and you and me, it's all the same. It's all chemicals and, and uh, it's all uh, particle uh, chemistry and physics. There's no special uh, angel matter. No, 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 it's all chemistry and physics. Everything we have, okay. So this chemistry and physics bouncing around, it went from, uh, ch chaos to replicating itself and now not only that something special happened the matter started to move itself me and you we move ourselves but we're supposed to be part of this chaotic matter now not only this matter moves itself this matter now has moral quandaries starts thinking about right and wrong not only that the matter now also praises God hmm. now you explain to me through a materialistic worldview, how is that possible? That's only possible if you put on a theistic worldview. God created Adam from the soil and he breathed into him this ruh. That ruh, that's something special. That's something that is alien to this world. Makes everything, it all makes sense. But if you told me it's just chemistry and physics, stop. Let's, it, let's look at it the other way. How could it replicate itself move itself, have moral quandaries, and then it's going to start praying to a God, to God. It can't just be chemistry and physics. That's why we have to go, we have to graduate beyond the scientific method. The scientific method is very useful, but mm -hmm. this is pragmatism. It fills our bellies. It gives us shelter. We could talk to each other from a distance. It's useful. Science is useful, but it can't be the end all be all because it's to, to accept it as an end all be all paradigm is an absurdity. Yeah. It doesn't, the scientific worldview, the atheistic materialistic worldview cannot account for agency. How did matter start to move itself? There is no scientific observation for this. There is no scientific property for this. We have to, we have to invoke a new way of, we have to invoke a new way, a new discipline to answer these questions. There are no properties to morality. We cannot take morality and put it in a test tube. Yeah. 
This is beyond the scientific scope. So if you do put on your scientific hats and you weld them on, guess what you're going to have in the future? You're going to have movement one day of Hitler-like thinkers. We're going to be like, hey, it's all engineering, man. I can move these people's heads off their shoulders. It doesn't matter. It's just nuts and bolts. Like I, yeah. like I changed my car tire, I can change this, this population here. I'll just eviscerate them. They're not to my liking. It's all engineering. It's all nuts and bolts. Obviously, we no, none of us think like that. And also, you'd have to do that to yourself because never forget this, okay? The atheistic worldview cannot account for agency. If you believe that you have thoughts, if you believe that you're rational, if you believe that you think and move and, and have a relationship, and you, 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 then you, if you believe you're a human, if you believe, then you can't believe in chemistry and physics as the end all be all. It can't be just uh, random forces. Again, there has to be a discipline that answers those questions that takes into account those questions. It's a glaring, it's it's glaringly obvious, but we get the scientific worldview hammered down into our throats all day long, all day long. Why? Because they control all the resources. That's the truth. Tomorrow, when they don't control the resources, all the resources, it won't be like that anymore. It yeah. wasn't like that in the past. It won't be like that again in the future. We're just going through a phase now where it's cool to be rebellious to Christianity. I get it. They came out of the dark ages because they rebelled against Christianity. But that's not everybody's experience. It's not. It's definitely not the Muslim experience. Definitely not. And, you know, now I think the tide has turned where people are now starting to feel like the new tyranny, the new orthodoxy mm -hmm. is the materialistic, naturalistic yeah. perspective. And they want to rebel against that. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> one, of the, one of the authors who I really uh, like to uh, refer to is Thomas Nagel. Now, mm -hmm. Thomas Nagel is a A-grade philosopher He's a household name in philosophy, yet he committed the heresy of challenging Darwinism. And when he actually did that, that led to an academic backlash. Why were academics lashing out at him? Why were they? Because all he was basically saying was he was sympathizing with intelligent design, although he doesn't believe in God. He was pointing out that um, this assumption that, you know, all of life evolved uh, uh, in this naturalistic way, and it began off in a, with a naturalistic origin. This is a presumption that is governing the scientific enterprise, not something that's scientifically proven. So um, what we find with him is that, you know, he's going against the grain, and we are finding uh, certain uh, uh, biologists, certain, um, you know, philosophers who are you know, putting their career at risk and, and going against the grain. And I do believe that with the way that currently the, the, the scientific world is uh, structured uh, in terms of journals and the fact that anybody with, uh, you know, slight even inclinations towards intelligent design or, or theism is is not allowed to publish and, and you know, uh, they're discarded, that this, is, this problem, this struggle is going to go on for a lot of time. Um, I just wanted to highlight one small thing before we uh, go to Huberman's um uh what's it called uh, a clip um one of the ways that thomas kuhn describes the uh the the challenge to orthodoxy is that you have the radicals you have the revolutionaries and then you have the normative science which is like the orthodoxy so the way he describes it is 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 in a way um that you have an insurgency against the government is that you have these people in this fortress who are uh, seeing that these people are coming and they are, you know, shooting arrows at us, and they're trying to defend the f a fortress, and they, they're becoming more and more stern in, in the in the actual thinking. And then you have these revolutionaries that come, and these revolutionaries, what they do is they they overtake the normative science. There's a paradigm shift, mm -hmm. and this is what's so interesting about Kuhn. Then he says the radicals become. The new orthodoxy, the orthodoxy. Yeah, and that's and that's what's happened with Darwinism. Mm -hmm. Darwinism was radical. Darwinism was a challenge mm -hmm. to the orthodoxy, but now it has become <coughs> the orthodoxy itself. And the same with the materialistic perspective. That there was a time where um, you know I, I, there was this fantastic quote uh, that I was reading today of Newton, where Newton was basically making fun of. Um, atheism and saying atheism is idolatry in practice mm -hmm. and you will not find um, basically atheist professors. So he's talking about his own time. He's saying there's no atheist professors. <laughs> now, now it's the opposite. 
So mm. the, 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 the orthodoxy of the past is the mm -hmm. heresy of today, yeah. right? Yeah. This is just the cycle of life. Yeah, absolutely. That's a that's a scientific revolution, right? You have a, you have a scientific uh, paradigm, and then there's these little there's these little evidences that are piling up, and they don't make sense with the paradigm you have, and they're pooling up, and we kind of sweep them under the rug. It doesn't make sense. It doesn't go with our, our our modern day paradigm, and then one day somebody comes up with a new paradigm that these little these little evidences you had on the side that didn't fit. Now it, it, it encompasses them. It, they also fit. Now we have this new way of thinking. And we have a scientific revolution. And then tomorrow, again, there's new little evidences. They don't fit this new paradigm we have. That's why we say science, science is transient. Absolutely. It will change over time. Guys, how many times do we have a, a scientific revolution? Kuhn says we have big ones and we have small ones. We might not have one for 100 years, but the next one we have could be colossal or it could be minute. There's scientific revolutions of all shapes and sizes you know they they had recently found in, 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 a, a new uh not an organ but a new i think it was an organ or something in the mouth or a salivary gland they, they found a new gland so they always had like i can't remember how many salivary glands you have in your mouth but they found two new ones think about it biology has been around for well over a thousand years they finally found two glands that have been overlooked mm. salivary glands or, or something along the line you have my minute scientific revolutions and then you have colossal ones so what's the next one gonna be i don't know you don't know we don't know so you know like for instance i'll give you i'll give you a great for instance isaac newton said the one constant we can rely on is time mm. time is not never gonna change time flows in one direction and at this constant speed and the, and that's what it is how long did it take that was the that was the most sure thing that was the thing hey we can we can like all our science that's one thing that, that it's not relative. Guess what? Einstein, not long after, really not long after. The one thing, oh, this is the one thing I'm sure of. Boom, swept the rug pulled out from under us. Now time is relative. Nobody disagrees. That's a new paradigm. Mm -hmm. But to, to Newton, time was a constant and it flowed in one direction yeah. and it was constant. Einstein says, no, it's not. Guess what? And it didn't take no thousand years to figure it out. Like it, that's how, that's how quick uh, uh, scientific revolutions can happen. And it also, it could take. It could have took a thousand years. We don't know. We don't know when the next one is going to be. We don't know, because science is done inductively. Science is done by discovery. You know, sometimes we debate that we discover math. Or do we, no, no, no. Science, we, there's no debate. It's all discovery. Like we discovered the penicillin, it was by accident. It, we, we're just tinkering around and we're seeing what happens and we're trying to uh, observe patterns. And once we have observed patterns, then we make predictions. Then we come up with hypotheses to test those uh, those beliefs. Yeah. We I, tinker I, around. Yeah. It's very interesting you say this because when you spoke about time as constant, there's two problems in the philosophy of science that came to mind. The problem of unconceived alternatives and the problem of un underdetermination. So let's just say the assumption that time is constant. Isaac Newton is using that. When we are using his formulas to come up with predictions about where planets going to be six months from now, mm -hmm. it's going to be there. Mm -hmm. Now, someone could turn around and say his background assumption that time is constant must be true because every single time we use his formulas, we find that actually the planets are there. Mm -hmm. But the problem of underdetermination and problem of unconceived alternatives shows that there may be theories that incorporate the data that you actually have, but it's a different interpretation. It's a different theory completely from the theory that we currently subscribe to. So it's either something which is underdetermined or it's something that we haven't thought about. And this is exactly what Einstein did. Einstein had the data, the same data, which others had. Now, obviously, Einstein got some new data, which, which was uh, anomalous to the Newtonian worldview, but there were some anomalies within the uh, scientific community at the time of Newton, but they didn't have a paradigm. They didn't have the idea that Einstein actually did. Now, as soon as Einstein had the idea and he used the idea to look at the data, the anomalous data did not look like mistakes. It looked like it all fit together perfectly well. So what we need to understand is that just because something works, like the Newtonian uh, mm -hmm. world, worldview worked for many, many years, it doesn't mean the background assumptions are correct. Mm -hmm. This yeah. is what's so important because what we find, what we find time and time again is, well, 
why is it that we can, uh, you know, we uh, we can develop vaccines and and you know we can uh, design rockets and we can do these things? If, if if science is not arriving at truth, why is this the case? Well, flip the question. Ask yourself if there's a different scientific theory in place. Like instead of Darwinism, it was intelligent design. Instead of um, mm -hmm. it all still works. It, it all still works. I mean, so those those things are not impacted by the history and by the assumptions that are actually there. Now, before we play this clip, I just want to check with you. It's been two hours. Are you okay for time? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Go ahead. Go for okay, so I'll just go back to his clip. Who do you pray to? Uh, that's an interesting one because I think uh, God. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I, I absolutely do. I've actually started reading the Bible recently, start mm -hmm. to finish. Mm -hmm. I, I feel like it's my duty to like learn and in some sense, compare Old and New Testament. Mm -hmm. I, I'm like really, I'm really interested in the stories, but I'm also, I'm fascinated by the story of us, right? And, and the story of everything. And so, but yeah, I pray out loud in the morning, um, sometimes again in the middle of the night if I wake up. Mm -hmm. And um, and it's only recently that I've been doing this more often. It's given you yeah. peace? Or... Oh, my goodness. It's given me so much. It's given me peace. And, you know, this is going to sound weird and probably people are going to be like, what are you talking about? If this, it, it, it works. Mm -hmm. It works. There's a, there's a way in which certain things I was grappling with, you know, um, I just couldn't resolve. Mm -hmm. I couldn't do it. And it was all internal and I just couldn't do it. What, what, how were you trying to resolve these things? Like have an answer? Yeah, discipline myself. I mean, mm -hmm. it wasn't like I was super, uh, you know, undisciplined. I mean, obviously I have a lot of self-discipline, but yeah. you know, I, like I, I always pray, you know, I want to remove my defects of character. I want to, um, you know, I, I certainly pray for other people. Um, I, I mostly, you know, these days I pray for the ability to really harness as much care and love for other people and for myself something i haven't been that good at mm -hmm. in my lifetime um in order to be able to put the best possible work into the world wow <laughs> that's some that's some really deep stuff so for us let's start off with his initial um I, I think one of the most important points that he made in this particular clip which is about prayer giving him peace and him being very direct that who do you pray to God, right? So what are your thoughts on that? Well, if you if we use scientific logic, well, if it works, it's true. Well, if it works, it's true. See, now they're gonna say, no, not in that instance. Well, if your scientific <laughs> methods work, then it's not necessarily true. Let's look behind the curtain. Let's yeah. see what look at the axioms. Okay, so th there's a good example for anybody out there who's atheist who could say, look, just because it works doesn't make it true. And I agree yeah. with that. But look, oh, excuse me. No worries. Sorry about that. I lost. Oh my God! Hold on one second. <laughs> it's my daughter. No, no, you, you could take it. So, no, 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 no. no. Um, no, no you no. know, uh, I I love the way that you you, you flipped it on them. So you said, okay, so <laughs> if, if something works, then it's true. The prayer works, then it's true as well. I, I really love that. Yeah, me. I mean, like that's that's. I, I'm not I'm not subscribing to that. I'm just saying, look look at what it sounds like when you tell us that. You know, like. And, I, and again, I, I, I'm a lover of science. Like we should never say it's not. We love science. We just think it's not the end all be all. I believe in science. Look, I have more trust in science than scientists. I'm telling you because I understand the axioms behind it. That's why. Look, for me, science, the patterns, of regularities in nature, it's the sunnah of Allah. That's Allah. what that's how I understand it in our deen. That's what it is. It's a sunnah of God. That's God's Allah. way. But remember, we were talking about how matter started replicating itself then it had agency it started to move itself but also this matter has a will volition i have yeah. will I have I have will and one of my wills is to connect with something greater than me why would you imagine how much you will suffer if you deny that why would you deny that because you have peer pressure from other people who think it's just not cool anymore because <laughs> they had a historical they had a historical they had a historical beef with Christianity. That's really, if you look at why academia is so stern and angry at, Christian, at, at religion, it's because they came out of Christianity in an in a unpleasant way. Now, again, I don't blame Christianity. I'm not saying, I think Christianity, 
you had many brilliant Christian minds and you had many that were like, like in every group. Okay. I'm not trying to single them out because look, Newton was a very religious Christian. He was a brilliant person. He was not anti-scientific. Of course not. Uh, you could say the same about Galileo. They were not anti, anti science, but they were also super religious. What I'm saying is it was just a culture, collective thinking that, oh, science uh, is uh, religion kept us from success. There was a collective, uh, there was a culture that came out of Europe. That's why they're so bitter about it. And now look, he he's, He's saying, look, I have this desire to connect with a greater power. I have this belief in God. It's innate. I can't deny it. I look at the world. The world is all pointing that something caused it all. Hmm. That this world is all contingent. It could have been otherwise. It's not necessary. It must come from a necessary being or else you have the problem of infinite regress. There has to be a first. There has to be a start. And that start could only be one thing that could. What's the one thing that can do it all? It doesn't need. It doesn't depend on anything else. It's only God. That's the only thing that we can come up with. There's nothing else. So he's having this innate experience, this, this rational thinking. And the only thing that can stop it, in my opinion, is psychology. It's just some bitterness or some anger or some peer pressure from the outside. Every human being naturally believes in God. We all have a direct experience with God. It, it's a major psychological issue if you deny God. It's it, That's what it is because... It's so evident. God is so evident. Yeah. Yeah. And um, for for God to be evident in your life, you need to be, as a person, humble. And what we find with uh, Huberman in, in the way that he's coming across, he's coming across very humble. When you look at people like Daniel Dennett, when you look at people like Richard Dawkins, when you look at people like Lawrence Krauss, you can smell the arrogance. You can smell this. I mean, I was just listening to... Um, Christopher Hitchens, he had a debate with William Dembski. Uh, and during the debate, what he was saying to the audience is, um, you know, he doesn't like the idea of there being a God. So it's mm -hmm. not just that there is no evidence for God. Um, he, he, he's saying, well, imagine if if it were true, you know, you, you'd be watched all the time. And, you know, so deep down, there's a there's a problem of mesotheism. There's a problem of hatred of God. There's a. I remember mm -hmm. the first time I came across somebody with these types of, um, you know, inclinations was um, when I spoke about the existence of God and I was speaking about an argument for the existence of God. Uh, one atheist said to me, and the, this is not I heard from. This is what he said to me. He says I don't like the idea of there being someone greater than me. Those were his literal words. I do not it's like eagle. the idea. Listen, <laughs> it's it, it, listen. The, the the story of Pharaoh in the Quran is highlighting. It's it's okay. It's historically true, but it's also there's a lesson behind. Of course, Pharaoh thought he was a god. He, he, his ego was massive. He thought people should be worshiping me. Not how dare you uh, worship this man's god mm. without asking permission from me first. It's all ego. Ego is the only thing standing between you and God. That's the truth. There are no atheists. If you're an atheist, you should really look in the mirror and humble yourself. And every human being that hears my words now knows God is true. The only thing standing between you and Allah is you. Yeah. God always extends the hand for every human. God always extends the hand for every human. It's the human to decide. Does he want to hold the firmest handhold or does he want to deny it? If you deny it, it's only because of some kind of pleasure or self-love or ego. There is no rationale. There is no good reason. It's all psychology. Absolutely. Um, one more thing uh, I wanted to just highlight about um, Huberman is there's an element of rationality that he's speaking about. So he's speaking about the biological uh, system of the brain and how it's the apex of design and he's speaking about you know mm -hmm. neuroplasticity and all that stuff but then there's an element of faith so then he goes immediately to prayer and he goes to the stories of the bible and how it makes him feel what we find um in uh, at least um, european history and you, you get this in some parts of uh, the the non-european world as well is that the jump from looking at the world rationally and inferring that there is an intelligence to faith is not there. 
So they would argue, uh, I've forgotten which uh, which philosopher, but there was a uh, philosopher, post-Enlightenment philosopher, who also made the argument, even though he believed in God, he made the argument that you can't jump from uh, the, 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 the design that you may see in the world uh, to faith so, so so there's a leap of uh, there's a leap of faith um so there's there's some who argue there's a leap of faith there's some that argue that the entire path is paved with rationality where would you be in in those two camps uh i believe like the classic thinkers and muslim thinkers do there's two paths to god you look around you see there's cause and effect it all has to go back to a necessary being an unmoved unmoved mover one to start at all he'd have to be He'd have to be infinite. He'd have to be wise. He'd have to, he, or else there, there would be no morality if, we, if, if there were, we wouldn't detect morality if there was no morality. He'd have to be a moral agent, etc. I believe in all that, but I believe above all that is the fitra. Beyond, it's the most powerful proof because you know it directly. You know, it, it it's so obvious, we can't deny it. You might as well try to deny existence. You might as well say, well, I'm not sure about existence. You cannot deny existence. You cannot. It's that obvious, but it's psychology. It's influence. It's psychology. It's people talking to you. It's trying to... It, it, people are enamored with themselves. Humble yourselves. Pray to God. You know, if let's say somebody out there believes themselves to be an atheist, I will tell you this. In your quiet time, pray to God. Pray, to, you know, if God, if you're really there, please, uh, you know, guide me. But you have to do it with sincerity. It won't be long before you believe in God. This is my opinion. Every human being has the perfect proof of God. Every human being has had a perfect, a, a direct experience of God. You discover that within yourself. For me, that's the strongest proof because rationale, if you use rationale, you believe in God. And there's nothing wrong with that. I think that's good. But I don't, I tell people, I don't believe in God. I know God exists. I know people think that's crazy, but that's uh, it takes courage to say it because I know people are going to think that's, that's mad. I have no doubt in God's existence, but it's not because of my rationale. My, I doubt every everything. Every rationale I have, I believe in things. I trust rationale, but I know that I'm not a perfect logician. I have limitations. I can make errors. But when it comes to first-person experience, I cannot be wrong. I believe ultimately Islam is about having a first experience first person experience with God that you've had in the past you've had it in the past you will have it again a first person experience with God is in the Quran Muslims you can't deny it you can't come and tell me oh well, that's innovation it's not it's in the Quran it's explicit God asked mankind who is your Lord oh you are one and only Lord is it all of mankind am I part of mankind we've all had that experience you can have it again you can have it in this world that is the perfect proof because then you won't say you just believe in God. You'll tell people, no, I know Allah exists. I know. But the vast majority of people will just believe because it's so obvious. You look at the world, there has to be there has to be a start. There can't be an infinite regress. We have to have an ultimate start, uh, an ultimate being to start it all. That being cannot be contingent himself or else it's infinite regress. There is logic. Logic is good. I'm not against logic, but it's not the highest proof. The highest proof is a direct experience with a God. Yeah, and, and and that's empirical. See, see, th see. This is important for us to realize. We're not saying there's the scientific perspective, the rational perspective, and then there's the airy fairy faith perspective. We're actually saying, from an epistemic point of view, the most clearest evidence you can have is a first person direct experience. And that I wouldn't say it's empirical. I would say it's intuition. Has Ali used the term intuition? I would use intuition, direct experience. And when you pray, you're getting closer and closer to that direct experience. If you pray correctly, you're supposed to be getting closer and closer to that experience. That when you say Allahu Akbar, there is nothing left. But there is an awareness still. And that thing, you, it's not in you. You're in it. It's, it encompasses everything. You don't encompass it. Allah. When you have that Copernican revolution, then you will say, oh, I, I know Allah. I don't, I don't believe in Allah only. Yes, mm -hmm. most Muslims will only reach the level of belief, and, and that's respectable, and that's good. But there are Muslims who will know Allah, and inshallah, I wish that on, on every person listening. Mm -hmm. When you say Allahu Akbar, and you throw the whole dunya behind you, and even yourself, and your ego, and go back to your fitra, you will see something that always was, always will be, doesn't erode, 
It encompasses everything and nothing encompasses it. And then you will see the world is, people's worldview is completely upside down. Just like they thought the sun goes around the earth, now they think it's completely backwards. Yes, it's the earth that goes around the sun. There's also another Copernican revolution to be had, and that's a, that's a spiritual one. Absolutely. To really serve. Like, I really see myself as serving higher power. Mm -hmm. Like, I'm a conduit. Right. Um, and the better I can do that, the better I'm serving. The better I'm serving, the more I feel connected to humanity. Do you think that with this, with this, I don't know if you've always felt like this, it sounds like it's more of a, a newer, newer feeling. But Somewhat, although secretly. Yeah. Like in Santa Barbara, I'll just say there's this place, Sands Beach, down at the end of the beach, if anyone's ever been there. And mm -hmm. I used to run down there once a week. I'd always did a long run, long for me, run yeah. on Sunday, yeah. minus a 72 pound rock. Right. And I would pray. Mm. And I just pray for, you know, be honest with myself, be honest with others. And that was years ago. I was 18. Oh, okay. 19, 20. So, um, and then, you know, I've seen some hardship along the way. I mean, I, would just mention that I've had three amazing scientific advisors. You know, Harry shot himself mm. two weeks after I told him we publish a paper in science. He said, come on down to Santa Barbara. It'd be great to take you out for pizza and celebrate. Mm -hmm. Two weeks later, ate a bullet in the bathtub. Barbara died of cancer when she was 50. I'm mm. friends with her daughter. I, you know, saw her. She did have those two kids. <laughs> yeah. One's a neuroscientist. Oh, man. Um, at McGill. And um, she was like a mom to me. Mm-hmm. He died. I was speaking at her memorial. And then my postdoc advisor died. He was a pretty impressive guy in mm -hmm. his own right. And so I, at one point I'm thinking like, what's going on? You know, I'm right. the common denominator. Right. How am I picking these people? Mm -hmm. But they were amazing. And, you know, I had some friends commit suicide, you know, this kind of thing. And, and you know, you live long enough, that's going to happen. People are going to go. Mm -hmm. That's just the reality. Mm -hmm. But there were times I'm like, you know, it was dark. It was, you know, like, where am I? Why? Why me? And at those moments too, just accepting that there's a plan and it's happening for a reason and I don't know what it is and just putting my trust in that has allowed me to, to grieve those things properly and to really try and, you know, I got the message, I got the download to take the lessons from them and just not waste a single day mm. and to do things that re I really felt mattered. Mm. So to me, it's all always been linked right. to you know, sort of forces greater than me, certainly. Does it feel like... So there's something very um, touching that he's speaking about, which mm. is mortality, right? If you live long enough, you will see people go. <clears throat> and what we find is certain uh, public intellectuals, their epiphany, their point of inflection was to do with a realization about death was to do with either they had a close encounter with death or somebody else did. What role does death have to play in the awakening of the fitra for you? Well, I don't, I don't know if you, you noticed, but he was saying like, oh, let's go celebrate. And instead of celebrating his friend, they had something, you know, they had some accomplishment right. that's meriting celebration. And to his friend, he said he ate a bullet in the bathtub. You can have everything, my friend. You can have everything. You can have reasons to celebrate. If you don't have a connection with Allah, it's all meaningless. It, remember, I've talked to you about this before. It's either you, this, it's either you believe in Allah, you discover God, or you, it's going to be nihilism. There is no other option. There is no other option. His friend was nihilistic. To kill yourself, you're nihilistic. A Muslim would never kill himself. A true Muslim would never kill himself. He would say, "This is the exact words that he used. Uberman used." God has a plan for me and this is it. To kill yourself is to despair. There is no plan. This is just pain, suffering, meaninglessness. If you if you don't believe in Allah, it doesn't matter. Even if you have the dunya, eventually the dunya will betray you. Your body will betray you. People around you you love will die. Life will betray Life will become misery. People think, you know, we, we try to make... You know, uh, in, in social media, TV, they try to make life look. Life is this beautiful joyride. Yeah, but joyrides end. We have to. We have to go beyond the joyride. We have to go beyond. Look, we have science, technology. We can bring you food and comfort and warmth and enjoy. Enjoy your state. Yeah, but 
human beings have this deep inner desire to connect with something higher and if if they don't if they don't hold on one second okay no no worries you can mute yourself and no, it's, it's, sorry it's my daughter she's incredibly persistent yeah yeah you can mute yourself and then you can talk mashallah faraz has been giving uh quite a bit of his time uh to you know discussing these issues and um you know, mortality, I mean, the way I would talk about mortality is that <clears throat> it's the common denominator between all human beings. You can be rich, you can be poor, you can be tall, you can be short, you can be beautiful, or uh, you don't consider yourself to be beautiful. You could be anything from any social background, from any educational background. We are all going into the ground. And uh, Islam actually liberates you from the anxiety of death it's sorry about that no, no worries no worries i mean i i, I was just uh, uh explaining that islam liberates you from death anxiety mm -hmm. right? it is it, i mean I, I look at for example um the fact that faith has a big role to play when it comes to suffering um and it, it's, it's not just to do with even if you're a Muslim, as long as you believe in God, there's a role that faith has in terms of how much suffering you can actually deal with. So uh, Viktor Frankl in his book, Man's Search for Meaning, you know, he's speaking about the experiences in Auschwitz. And uh, he's speaking about the people, the Jewish people who had the faith in God could deal with suffering more than the ones who did not believe in God. Mm -hmm. right? So the belief in God is is an anchor, is a rock. And what you find with Huberman is he's saying the same thing. I've been through tough times. I couldn't make sense of things. I, I couldn't understand why this was happening, why that was happening. And I just believe this was part of God's plan. This was part of God's decree. You know, so, you know, you need a background, a metaphysical background for the human being to flourish. And if the background is materialism, so there's no reason or rhyme, you know, uh, we're all uh, particles in motion. And, you know, uh, if your child gets hit by a bus, there's no uh, meaning behind it. Um, th this is not something which is going to give the human being comfort. Um, you know, if if somebody's child dies, right, and, and they're really emotional, um, this 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 lesson that the Darwinists and the atheists are trying to promote that... Um, uh, Essentially, everything that, that that happens to us, all of our emotions, all of our feelings, all of these things get broken down to biological mechanisms. And there is no true love. There is no uh, true sincerity. There is no true sympathy. You only love this child because they happen to share the same genetic material as you. Mm. No one buys that. There's Don't no you... such thing as love. Love is just a chemical. It's just a drug. You might as well in inject a needle in your arm. It's it's a proximate it's a proximate mechanism for your survival and reproduction. Yeah. That's it's it. a reaction to a, a a chemical process. Yeah. 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 Well, if you if you live that way, I mean, in my opinion, it's it's not the way man is meant to live, and that's why you're going to self destruct. Uh, in um, in Richard Dawkins' uh, writing, you you find a clear contradiction. Uh, which is, uh, I mean, the first time I heard this in a very, in the clearest way was when William Lane Craig did a review of The God Delusion. What he says, and I think it's the quickest way to knock down that book, is he does not believe in morality, right? He does not believe in objective, mm -hmm. um, uh, he doesn't believe in moral realism, that morals are objective, yet he is making moral judgments. He's making moral claims this is right this is wrong you know uh, religious people do xyz exactly that's, that's why that's... i tell them hey, if you're really if you're really a darwinist become muslim because we're the best at survival reproduction mm -hmm. who has the highest birth rate in the world muslims why aren't we living correct well how could you judge me why do you say i'm wrong what are you talking about we have the most children from every every group we have the most shouldn't you be praising shouldn't darwin be praising our system if there's mo no morality, Islam is, is number one. You know, it, it, it's it's psychology. It's his fancies. I want the world to be like this, and here's how I'm gonna I'm gonna use rhetoric to make the world the way I, I wish it was. Yeah. Who's the best at survival reproduction? Which group on earth is the best at survival reproduction? You, you know, 
this reminds me of uh, some of the some of the things that Alex Rosenberg says. So Alex Rosenberg uh, is a, a naturalist, an atheist, and he's been called a mad dog naturalist uh, because of his views. Now he's his famous book, An Atheist Guide. Mm, uh, I read it. Yeah. The universe, right? What he does is something amazing, uh, which other atheists don't actually do. Other new atheists don't do. He speaks about egalitarian values like feminism and mm -hmm. going against patriarchy and you know all, all this type of stuff. And he says these are are, are biologically uh, are biologically hardwired into us. So patriarchy is biologically hardwired into us. So you know when 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 Dawkins is speaking about these egalitarian values, and you have feminists as well who. Uh, the feminist movement is largely atheistic, right? Mm -hmm. um, they again are talking about these egalitarian values. Where do you get these liberal egalitarian values if you're not going to subscribe to a metaphysical worldview? Um, you're not going to believe in something immaterial. You are simply going to turn to society and biology. But if you're going to turn to society and biology, what you're going to find is patriarchy, gender roles, toxic masculinity, all of these things are hardwired. Um, recently, um, uh, Tubi Cosmides uh, passed away. He was an evolutionary psychologist. Him and his wife, Leda, <clears throat> they are the pioneers of evolutionary psychology, right? Mm -hmm. Evolutionary psychology is the exact opposite of all of these claims that these egalitarian claims that are being made by these new atheists. So evolutionary right. psychology is is essentially telling us that we evolved in the environment of evolutionary adaptation and during that environment when we went hunter-gatherer societies we have that stone age mind in the modern world which is why we have mismatches which is why we have um evolutionary adaptations which are maladaptive today now one of the reasons why this field was so controversial is because Things which are non-egalitarian, things which are non-liberal, they are explaining those things from a biological perspective. Because if you think about it, gender roles, toxic masculinity and patriarchy are needed to actually help you survive and reproduce and to have the most offspring. So if we look at it from a group selection point of view, um, you have two different groups, tribe A, tribe B. Tribe A has a bunch of feminists, right? Mm -hmm. Um we have children late and LGBT um, uh, alphabet people. Let's say they they are not, <laughs> they, they're not having children. Um, uh, they, mm -hmm. they don't have this. Um, they don't have the system of uh, gender roles, right? So you don't have the distribution of labor in this particular way. The women are working in. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, you know, they have careers and so on and so forth. Uh, toxic masculinity. You know the the, the general uh, masculine men are wearing of, dresses. Yeah, all, all of that kind of stuff. All right. <laughs> then you have tribe B, right? Mm -hmm. And say this tribe is uh, similar to the tribe of uh, the people of Nuristan in Afghanistan, right? Because one of, one of my friends, Rahmatullah Noruz, he's from that very rare region, which is actually uh, has Greek ancestry. So they look Greek. Mm -hmm. So these people, right? Super conservative, right? Super conservative. You get the man as the head of the family. He has multiple wives, multiple children, mm -hmm. you know, the, the wife uh, mm -hmm. has, uh, she's not going to be working in a, a, you know, having a career. And you think the Darwinists uh, would love him. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, I mean, you're getting married early, all that stuff, right? Mm -hmm. When well, you're most fertile. Selection. Yeah. Group selection point of view, who, which group is going to get selected? Obviously the group mm -hmm. that is producing the most offspring. So when you extrapolate that, to civilization when you extrapolate that at a large scale what you're going to find is that these egalitarian values with richard dawkins and 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 lawrence krauss and these guys are trying to push they are going to put their group at a disadvantage so th this is something i was i was thinking about the other day conservatism is selected from a darwinian perspective so you will always find that <laughs> I totally agree. And the problem is even worse than that. Let me tell you something, okay? Yes. Suppose you were a, a, a young man with lots of money and uh, you were not inhibited from premarital sex and you wanted to go out and party and have fun. What what country would you go to? Just pick one off the top of your head. Holland. <laughs> Holland? Okay, you go to Holland. You go to, you go to a European country where the women are liberal, etc. So not only are they not breeding themselves, they're... they're, they're Foreign, foreign competitors are enticed to come. 
like for instance like here here in, in where i live okay they 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 really they're very against toxic male masculinity being territorial the women are very liberated everybody's free society but there's also people coming from all over the world so the young man in in you know, he's looking to get married. He's not only competing with the men in his country, he's also competing with all the foreigners coming with all their money and their fancy cars. Why? Because you wouldn't do that with a conservative country. A conservative mm-hmm. country, like for instance, Qatar, if you go and you have extramarital sex, you, you if you're a foreigner, you come in, you have extramarital sex with a Qatari woman, you're going to do seven years in jail. Wow. Like during the, the, the World Cup, that was a law from what I read on the internet. They, they passed a law. They, they have a law, I should say, you you can go to jail for it. I think that's, I think that's a country of top G's. I I, I applaud them. I don't want my country being. I don't want the, the young naive women in our country, like for instance, I have I have a daughter. God forbid a, a man make a mistake of taking advantage of my daughter, he, he would face an enormous consequence. He would wish the day he, he, he it never happened. But that's because I'm a father and I and I protect my daughter and I love my daughter and i love the women in my family and that's the kind of man i am i'm conservative now the whole country is a a country of conservatives they protect their women whereas the country of liberals it's kind of like i hate to say the word but there's a word out there it's it's kind of insulting so i don't want to say but it's like oh here take take here come and like it's almost like they've yielded oh yeah we're competing for resources here take mine and i'll take whatever's left no 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 the the men are in charge of the country. That's how I see it. And I defy anybody to go and tell the Ukrainians they're not in charge. When the Ukrainians were invaded by Russia, they they had all the women and children leave and they stood back and fought. Only 18% of uh, the population is female in the Ukraine during the war because they said, hey, look, our women are, are going to get captured. They're going to get hurt. Let's take the women and children out. Let's defend this country. Where are the feminists now? They're not screaming and yelling and saying, no, we should be one wa- one woman fighting the war and our children should be leaving with one man, one woman in equal numbers. That's not the case. Everybody now sees the logic of the men staying behind and the women and children escaping. Why? Because you know you could repopulate with a very small number of men. You could repopulate the civilization with a very small number of men, but you can't do so with a very small number of women. Mm. It shows that men are in charge. It shows that, look, when it comes to violence and war, men are in charge. And why shouldn't men have that extra degree of authority over women when they have to fight to the death to maintain? Now, I'm not talking about people are going to take this, oh, this is domestic violence or whatnot. No, 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 not at all. Men should treat their women with respect, love, care, be good. But at the end of the day, men are the protectors. Don't ever forget that. We forget that because we live in a time of peace. But tomorrow, if there's an army marching by your border, you're gonna be like, "Hey, where are all those men that we used to uh, that we used to have around?" Oh, you told them being manly was uh, toxic, and therefore they they they're they're confused with whether they're men or women. They're not even sure if they're men or women. Half of them are wearing dresses, they're wearing makeup, etc. Yeah. Oh well, now we might find ourselves in a dire situation. We have a natural way of living. I always tell my children, you know, because my children, they're, they're heavily bombarded by LGBT uh, propaganda because it, they go to school. And I live in the most LGBT progressive country in the world. I tell my children, we live a certain way and it makes sense. Why? If I was living that lifestyle, you wouldn't exist. Your teacher wouldn't exist if his parents were living that lifestyle. Don't you want to have, our family wouldn't exist. How could you have a family if we're not? It takes a man and a woman to make it a family. So we respect our roles. And does it make sense for if a burglar comes in the house that I send my wife? I ask my kids, does it make sense I send my wife or should I go? I have more chances of survival. And so what if I die? You guys can live without me, but it's more difficult to live without your mother. So like it all makes sense. And women, I always give the death. Whenever I argue with a feminist, I always give the, the death blow argument. This is what I tell young men. Don't, don't, be, don't be brainwashed by their by their arguments they're all futile here's the death blow argument i always tell them look what do women spend their money on when it comes to romance novels the star of the romance novel the hot, the, the biggest selling romance novels is always a guy who's very masculine and he has all these traits mm-hmm. he's masculine he's authoritative not authoritative but he's he's in charge let's say he's powerful he's uh you know he's robust he, he's very manly i've never once heard 
of a romantic novel which stars a guy who's not sure if he's a man or a woman. He wears a dress. He, so he speaks with a very soft voice and he's cowardly. No, it's always the opposite. And you know what's, you know what's so, so funny about that? Um, it's not even to do with a woman fantasizing about a normal man. It's normally the dangerous guy. It's normally the wild person, the person who's a little bit violent, the person who's well, coming think, with a motorcycle. But they they teach men to be a certain way, and then they kept those men are having trouble with women. Yeah. Like, uh, you know, there's a great phenomenon called friend zone. I've never been friend zoned by a woman. I've never, I've, I don't have friends that are like, if I have a friend that's a, that's a woman, she's married or she's part of the family, or I don't have friends as women, women as friends. Like, I know it sounds weird to people, but I didn't grow up hanging out with girls. If I, I, Look, I grew up with my cousins, my family, yes. And I I, I don't like it's almost what, what I'm trying to say, it comes off wrong. Like I went to school, it was co ed. Okay, don't get me wrong. But I hung out with guys. Like I was with guys all the time because I find it absurd. To, like I find it absurd. I think it's a lie to say that a man and a woman could be friends and just there. It's either one of them is not attracted to the other. There is, it's normal. It's normal to be with an attractive woman and feel something. Whereas now they try to teach our kids that, no, 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 you could be perfectly, like, you know, I, I come from the jiu-jitsu world. They tell me a man and a woman, even if they're attracted together, they can wrestle together and not have a single, uh, yeah. no, that's not the content. I find that to be a lie. If you, you I find that to be a lie. I find yeah. that to be a lie. Let's let's just say, yeah. you, you, I, you're either, okay, I, I call those guys, you're higher than an angel. I tell them, you're higher, you're more holy than the Pope. Even the Pope can, can't reach this level of holiness. It's a lie, guys. It's a lie. And look, I'll tell you this because we have so many issues in, in, in the jiu-jitsu world. Type in jiu-jitsu and the word molestation or jiu-jitsu or MMA and the word rape. And you're going to see that's not even 1% of cases. There, we have, there's tons of issues. There's It's very problematic. Women and men, we have disputes all the time. In my gym where it's quite more strict than most, I still have issues. It's not possible, in my opinion, to deny your biology and it's not because we're weak or heathenist. It's because we admit to our biology. Me, I admit my biology. I admit to my biology. I'm part animal. I'm part biology. Okay, I'm not saying I'm this perfect guy, but I admit to it. People, I think, try to deny it or they're raised in a way to think that, hey, it's, it's a non-existent. I, I find it to be absurd to deny that yeah. we have these urges or... We have to be honest about them. Look, I'm part man. If you put an attractive woman on top of me and I'm wrestling with her, there's going to be a launch sequence. And that it, launch it, sequence, it, I don't want to. I don't want to. I don't want to try to convince myself it shouldn't be. Yeah. No, I'm, I'm married. I have my. I have my wife, and I enjoy uh, the good and forbid the evil, of course. Yeah. But they they try to deny the biology, liberalism, feminism, all this. It's so much. It's denying the biology so much. It's creating societal problems. And young men, not young women, young men bear the brunt of the negative effects. That's my opinion yeah, on, on the matter. Yeah. yeah, those are some really in interesting thoughts. And it reminded me of the clearest contradiction that you will find in universities and colleges all across the world, which is we have two different camps, right? We have the, the camp of Rousseau. We have the camp of Hobbes, right? Now, the camp of Hobbes is obviously closer to the Darwinian paradigm. And that's what's taught in colleges and schools, that this is how we came about. Yet it's the Rousseau model, the egalitarian, the noble savage, the romantic idea of what humanity is supposed to be like, that that is what human nature is supposed to be like, that our policies and our behavior is supposed to, um, uh, that's the way that they want us to actually behave. So they create an environment where they're telling youngsters that actually, uh, there is no God. The the atheist Genesis story is essentially this Darwinian story. You know, the first cell, the tree of life, uh, you know, survival uh, of the fittest. Uh, nature is uh, red in tooth and claw. So essentially the Hobbesian human nature. Yet when it comes to behavior, they mm -hmm. expect us to have the Rousseau human, the Rousseauian perspective of the noble, noble savage. But the fact is we are closer to that savage, uh, that savage type behavior. What happens? I mean, I, I just want you to consider something. What happens when things start to fall apart, right? 
<laughs> Joker in Batman, he has this scene which is amazing, right? He's talking about, oh, you people with your society, you know, you believe you're so um, functional and civilized and moral, but actually this is just a veneer under underneath which you are basically savages and i'm just ahead of the curve right mm -hmm, mm -hmm. now where, exactly. where do we see this for us where do we see this we see this when law and order breaks down a few years ago here in london i don't know if you remember um uh there was a young man that was killed in some uh, I, I believe it's some police action and young people started uh, rebelling and fighting and it was no, this right, is right, right. i remember the algerian fight. kid okay mm. now oh my god the stories Bro, the stories coming out of the London riots is just crazy. One of my friends was in Southall, right? And people were just going, like normal people were going and smashing up shops and grabbing something. Now there's one guy, now subhanAllah, this is a crazy story. This guy, he was cycling. He's just, just cycling casually down the road in London and someone threw a brick at him and oh. took him out. Like it was like a war zone. And these are not like stories in newspapers. This is like my friend telling me this happened. My friend telling me this happened. London riots was a time in which, you know, from a Joker's perspective, the veneer of civ uh, uh, civility, right? This breaks down. And by the way, this is something David Stove speaks about in the Darwinian fairy tales, right? He says, <clears throat> you know, Darwinists are basically telling us that at rock bottom, we're just uh, purely selfish. We just have this, uh, this, this, uh, this plastering of, 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 you know, morality and ethics and, and, and humanity. But once that breaks down, we're all like this. So what's basically happening is all across the world, people are starting to see the emperor has no clothes. Mm -hmm. These people don't have a solution. So they've been telling us to live in an egalitarian way and we will be egalitarian while there are no policies. There is no conservatism. The family structure is going to break down. And then in this society, you're, you, you expected things to actually function. When things don't function, things actually break down. What do we have taking place right now? We have trends on TikTok where people are going towards conservative values. People are reading the Quran. You get mm -hmm. these uh, people who are like, you know, with pink hair and, you know, this type of thing, speaking about the Quran. You're finding young people now are starting to realize the new orthodoxy, the new uh, hegemony of this liberal wokeness is so sickening for those people that they are becoming more conservative. I don't, I don't know if you've had the same experience in Canada that I've had in the UK, but I find college students, university students are way more conservative today than they were when I was at college, way more. Mm. And they, I believe that our generation was more conservative than the generation before. Mm -hmm. And why is that? Because human beings, you know, when they go one way too much, human nature, it snaps them back. The pendulum that. swings. That's why I say it. the pendulum swings. You know, like, think about this, okay? And just 100 years ago in the, in the US, on the US beaches, maybe a little bit more, maybe 120 years ago, 150 years ago, it was argued, should a woman show her ankles at the beach? <laughs> And then, you know, they had a big controversy. Some women, yes. Some women, no. Some people, some men said yes. Some men said no. It's just the ankle. What's the big deal? Okay, you show the ankle. Then a few years down the line, everybody's showing the ankle. What's the big deal? It's the ankle. Then you have the next group. Oh, let's go above the shin now. Just a little higher. And a big controversy happens again, et cetera, et cetera. And then the influencers decide. And now the, the bathing suit is up above the shin. Fast forward, you know what happens. Fast forward 100 years, now they're wearing a thong. But once you see women like that all the time, all of a sudden, what becomes attractive, it's the opposite. A woman who's conservative. The pendulum swings. One day, now, you know, after the, the app uh, revolution, you know, Tinder and all these crazy apps, everybody's getting sick now of the hookup culture because they've realized that, hey, it's just one meaningless person after another. It becomes the novelty wears off. Now you want something more meaningful. All these girls are being... Uh, you know, they're, they're being passed around and all these guys are now upset because they can't find the right girl. All the girls that they're with, oh, they've been with so many guys. So they have these new problems that they didn't foresee when they first, the, the, hot, the app was new and hot and, and popular. The pendulum is going to swing to conservatism. It, it's beyond a shadow of a doubt. Why? Because so many new ailments are going to come about. And the girl who's going to be the most attractive and the guy who's going to be the most attractive is going to be the one that stands out, the one that's conservative. Yeah. So a guy would say, wait, that girl, she doesn't show her body. Or that girl, she's more serious. And that girl, oh, I respect her. She's not like all these other girls. No, these other girls, 
you know, it, it's always contrast. So when women are very conservative, the girl who is less conservative is attractive. When the girls are all uh, uh, liberal or whatnot, the conservative girl, the smaller group is always at one point more attractive and the pendulum swings. At one point, people are looking for liberal women than the conservative women and it swings back and forth, you know. Mm. But ultimately speaking, <clears throat> conservative women build families and liberal women generally, uh, uh, statistically speaking, now I'm talking about statistically, don't. Yeah, yeah. And it's interesting, <clears throat> this can be uh, explained from a from a perspective of dopamine as well, right? So one of the things Huberman speaks about is that you have a baseline dopamine. And if you have a peak, the problem with having a peak is that you're going to go below your baseline. So your baseline dopamine is what you need. You need that to function. If you're going to drink water, you need dopamine. If you're going to eat, you need dopamine. They've mm -hmm. removed dopamine from mice and those mice died with food next to mm -hmm. them. Mm -hmm. Because they couldn't do anything. So what happens is you have a baseline dopamine, which you need. And every single time that you have a peak experience, right? The peak experience could be heroin, could be pornography, could be uh, something else wild, so, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. As soon as you have a peak, you're going to go below the baseline and you're, you're now going to have a deficit, right? And what's going to happen is, you're going to need something to obviously uh, bring you back up and people go for mm -hmm. another experience and then they go below the baseline, even below the uh, the low from last time and it, it mm -hmm. spirals downwards. So Islam, what does it do? Islam teaches you to live a life in a way that's balanced because what happens is when you live in a life, uh, a very hedonistic perspective, it actually leads to the saddest life. It mm -hmm. actually leads to um, a depression. So one of the things um, I was looking at a few years ago, it's fascinating, was brain scans, right? Brain scans of, of people that feel pleasure. So it, it had a scan of the brain and it had uh, the red spot for extreme pleasure, yellow spot. Uh, uh, so like the, say this, the, mm -hmm. the, the nucleus was red and then around it was yellow. And so that, that that's the brain. So when a brain has a, a experience, right, a positive experience and it enjoys itself, you get that pleasure. Now, what's interesting is people who have addictions, right, whatever type of addiction it is, and they are constantly going for that high, they are damaging their dopamine receptors. And what ac actually ends up happening is you release less dopamine. So they, they showed the scans of those people and those people, the red spot disappeared completely, which is extreme pleasure, it mm -hmm. goes you get scattered amounts of yellow, right? And that keeps going down. Now, what does Islam do? What does not only Islam, conservative faith uh, do? Mm -hmm. It stops you taking those highs. What does Allah say about alcohol? What does Islam say about heroin? What does Islam say about pornography? What does Islam say about these, the, the, these peaks? Essentially, those are taken out. Because, look, you have kids, I have kids. We, we know this happens, right? your children are watching a TV program and they're laughing and they're playing Minecraft or whatever. They're super happy. You take off the plug and you tell them to read a book. They simply can't do it. They simply can't go from such a high experience to such a low experience. However, if they wake up in the morning and they haven't done anything so far and you get them to try and read a book or do something, mm -hmm. they can do it because they're going from something low to something right, high. Right. So it's about contrast. Now, what Islam does is Islam governs your life in a way that there's halal and haram and the halal and haram leads to the peak experience which mm -hmm. is why muslims are very happy people but like, a sustainable peak experience it's in a sustainable way yeah a more meaningful way and also don't forget ramadan the ramadan resets also yes. your dopamine levels your your dopamine uh sensitivity because once also once you deprive yourself then when you go back to having breakfast again oh you you feel that dopamine rush once again. You know, uh, uh, Ramadan is such a special time, and uh, the West can learn so much from practicing Ramadan. The West can in the West can benefit so much from uh, Ramadan. I'll tell you why. They they load their foods with so much fat, sugar, and salt because they've completely detrained their palate. They can't taste anymore. They need more sugar, more fat. It's become a race. They never reset their palates. They never reset their bodies. They never deprive themselves. But when you fast all day, you know there's just even a healthy meal, a rice and chicken tastes incredible after a long day of fasting. 
even the simplest foods taste incredible. You don't need all that salt. I'm I'm enjoying my healthy food even more than you're enjoying your junk food. But Absolutely. it's in a sustainable, healthy way because we do, we do, I mean, Ramadan has many benefits, but one of them also is to reset. Like I always say, it's like recharging your battery, you know, because if you're constantly trying to reach higher highs, eventually you, you're you going to reach the lowest lows. You're actually going to crash. How do we stop that crash? One is a yearly reset is also very important. A yearly reset is crucial to keeping the human being uh, satisfied and happy, etc. I mean, Islam answers so many issues. It, it resolves so many issues, and this is also one of them. Yeah, yeah. Which is why what we're seeing here in the West is um, in, a, in a sea of hedonism, in a sea of pleasure, in a sea of, of heresy, from a, from a faith-based perspective, we are finding the only faith that people are turning towards is Islam. Hmm. And we're seeing this through social media. We're seeing this through TikTok. We're seeing this through many different avenues. I, I've met people from the most uh, unbelievable backgrounds accepting Islam. Why? Because Islam is something that will attract you because it's 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 there to bring out the happiness in you. I mean, and Andrew Huberman is obviously not a Muslim, but but just he sounded like one. I could tell you, yeah. he sounded like one. Yeah, inshallah. As soon inshallah. And, and, and what we can see from him is he's getting peace from faith. Mm. Now we know we know that in the Quran, Allah says unquestionably, in the remembrance of Allah, do hearts find peace. So we know that that's what faith actually leads to, and we know that mm -hmm. this is something true. The, you know, it works. You know, the way he says it, it actually works. So I'm going to play um, some more of his clip uh, and then we'll have a discussion. Like, you know, when I hearing all this, does it feel like once you've taken like the, a, a more, I don't know, intentional turn for being grateful and praying, you're not drinking since 2019, it seems like that's been in tandem with your success. Uh, absolutely. Um, you know, I always wanted to have a deeper relationship to, to God. I always wanted that. And mm -hmm. I kind of was like, why don't I have that? Well, duh. That's like saying, I want to be fit. Why well, I'm not, I'm not fit. Mm -hmm. Well, because you're not running, you're not, not lifting, you're not doing the things. It was like, yeah. and it was, a, um, a couple of different people that kept showing up in my life and, and, and they were doing it. And it was like, well, pray. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I've learned, and I certainly try and do this, that a lot of prayer is about listening. Mm. And a lot of prayer is about you, you ask for things or listen for things. And then an hour later, two days later, you go, wait. Mm -hmm. Like it doesn't happen in the moment necessarily, just like fitness. I don't right. want to compare fitness. I don't want to trivialize prayer by, by comparing to right. fitness, but there's some parallels that are relevant. Yeah. yeah. You, uh, it's right. consistent work. Yeah, it's consistent work. And then all of a sudden, like things come up. Mm -hmm. And you're like, oh my goodness, I can't believe it. That makes so much sense. Now, I think that the success of the podcast, first of all, I'm incredibly grateful for it. Incredibly grateful. But in many ways, I'm doing exactly what I was doing when I was that six, seven, eight, nine-year-old kid. I'm yeah. learning and sharing. So it was always in me. And it always felt like this energy, this thing, like it's like, how did, how did I end up like this? How come all the other kids like don't have this? Mm -hmm. And how come sometimes it feels like a little bit of a, not a curse, but kind of a burden. Like, what do I do with this? And the deep satisfaction for me comes from acknowledging this is me. I've always been this way. It's not going to change. And that I, it's not coming from me. It's coming through me. Right. And I just want to do right by it. Mm -hmm. And I think we talked a it's little a, bit. Of, it's a gift and you're honoring your gift. That's right. Essentially. Yes. Yes. Well, and I feel like yeah. if we're honoring our gifts, we're, we're rewarded. Absolutely. And and I think one of the biggest rewards recently comes from, and we talked a little bit about this on the mountain today. It's like for me, the sweet spot that I finally get steady glimpses of is being loving, but also realistic. Mm -hmm. like, it, like you can be so loving that you lose touch with the reality. Too much trust isn't good either, but you don't want to be unloving to yourself and others because then you look at the world through cynical lens and then you're not going to be doing your best work. So for me, it's all about being loving, but realistic. Mm -hmm. And I think prayer helps me arrive there. It does many, many other things. I also just feel like 
our time here is limited and I've been so blessed by people that have come along. I mean, those academic mentors meant everything to me, mm -hmm. but so did the academic mentors that I didn't work for directly that helped me along. So did the high school football coach that taught me how to lift. So did Lex Friedman, you, Joe Rogan, right? Rich Roll, people who gave me the opportunity to talk on their podcasts about science and and then eventually, you know, we started our own podcast. So to me, it's this like beautiful ecosystem. And I never, ever think of myself as like, okay, like I'm here professing to people. I just, mm -hmm. I just love being a part of it. I also just like when I was a kid, I'm crewed up with a bunch of great people, mm -hmm. you know, and it's not all guys, Rhonda, Patrick too, who, by the way, folks, people always say, who was first man in on public facing science and health education? Uh, not first man, first woman, it was Rhonda. Mm -hmm. She was the first. Then right. came Matt Walker, me, some others, right? Mm -hmm. So I think the community of podcasters also, I feel like, wow, like this is as great as when I discovered neuroscience. Mm. And I actually feel more resonance with podcasters because it's really like of the love. You, you can't have a podcast that is worth anything in terms of its success or its content unless the person doing it loves that thing. Right. Like you can't, it's not journalism. It's not media. I mean, and there's a media component because mm -hmm. it's public facing, but it's like you love bow hunting. Yeah. You love fitness. You love ha hammering away every day. Right. Yeah, right. And so it, you're, you're basically talking about the things that you would be doing anyway. And mm -hmm. so am I, and so is Joe and so is Lex and so is Rich, right, you know, so right. is Rhonda. Yeah. And we're make, getting paid for this. Right. Exactly. I do this for free. Exactly. So if anyone out there wants to do a podcast or social media, what I would say is make sure that what you talk about is something that you really, truly care about. Now, what's interesting is, you know, um, his humble behavior, his grateful behavior to, you know, the ecosystem of support. And he's 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 going back to not only being grateful to God, but being grateful to people now. Islam values good traits in people and wisdom is the lost, uh, lost property of the believer. So, you know, when I was watching him speak in this way, I was thinking, why doesn't Daniel Dennett speak in this way? Why doesn't Lawrence Krauss speak? That's in this a great way? question. Sam Harris speak in this way. Why is it always me, 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 my story? I did this. I did that. You will find, I mean, look, <clears throat> Allah speaks about this in the Quran as well. Allah speaks about the positive traits that the Christians have and I believe he's a Christian um, and you know faith brings that in you faith you know faith is something which is supposed to bring out that 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 that, um, that behavior in you those morals in you those ethics in you that humanity in you you will not get the I mean what does Darwinism bring what does atheism bring what does materialism and naturalism bring it brings the type of behavior we saw in the Soviet Union. I mean, let, let's let's just be very clear about it. If this, Darwinism right? is true, uh, what Hitler did wasn't wrong at all. Eugenics is true. Leonard Darwin, Charles Darwin's son, was the father of eugenics in this country, right? Mm -hmm. He's mm -hmm. the president of the Eugenics Society, whatever mm -hmm. it was. So what we have to keep in mind is that what we have in the world today is a materialistic perspective which is telling us to have egalitarian values but what we find is faith-based systems conservative systems are giving you those faith uh, are, are bringing out those values which are supposed to be there from an atheistic materialistic perspective and we don't find that look you know what i what i hear all the time i'm not sure if you've uh, you've been to these countries but you know what we hear all the time is the most atheistic and the most progressive and the most uh, happiest countries are the Scandinavian nations. So, you know, Norway, Sweden, you know, mm -hmm. uh, Switzerland, whatever. Not Switzerland, uh, but you get my point. Uh, so these Scandinavian countries. However, what we find is there's high level of depression in these countries. There's individualism, rampant individualism. Uh, there's rampant materialism. And happiness is correlated with gross domestic product. And obviously it's not. Happiness is way, way more than that. What we find is that happiness is related to your social network. That's a big part of happiness. And social networks 
grow sometimes in non-materialistic societies, non-wealthy societies. And we find that the greatest social systems that actually exist, exist in conservative uh, areas of the world, uh, places like Afghanistan, places like, uh, you know, uh, Nigeria, um, you will find people living in, in, in ways in which they have lots of friends, lots of family, everyone gets together, everyone eats together, everyone spends time together. Mm -hmm. And that is true happiness. True happiness is not going to be coming through, you know, in individualism and materialism. And we have to realize just like the, the individual level selection, the gene gene centric perspective, which is telling us that at rock bottom, we are supposed to be selfish. We are finding in society, people are acting like that. People are actually actually mm -hmm. acting like that. And it's no coincidence that Richard Dawkins' book, The Selfish Gene, took off at the same time that Thatcher and there's no free lunch. And, you know, this individualism was something that was uh, quite culturally. Yeah, I sent you the, the life satisfaction because I think we have to differentiate a bit from between happiness and life satisfaction. Happiness is, it's it's now, okay, in, in my youth, in this stage of my life, am I happy? But total life satisfaction is like you're going through a hard time, but you're still satisfied. Alhamdulillah, you're still satisfied your life. You still you, you still feel like there's something, uh, there's a purpose, etc. Life satisfaction, in my opinion, is more important than happiness because happiness comes and goes and I know my happiness has to end. But life satisfaction is I know that this life is a certain step and there's going to be more. I'm living in this paradigm. It's far superior. I feel more satisfied. The context, living in this context, it explains to me why people live and die, etc. But happiness can be taken away from you in a second because, okay, let's say, I don't know, let's say you're a famous actor and tomorrow, whoa, you got a cancer. You got three months to live. Young people might be hearing this. Oh, that never happens. That happens to other people. Believe me, I, I'm 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 in my forties now. I know plenty of people who passed away in an instant. Um, <clears throat> I just looked it up real quick. Uh, this one, yeah, it just basically says uh, Muslims have the highest level level of satisfaction. They have a feeling of oneness. This is something I've read a while back. I just uh, looked it up. This one's from the Daily Mail, if I remember correctly. I want to get a more uh, like a uh, secular source. <laughs> yes, yeah, it's, it's the worst. But they they obviously citing a, a, a real study. They're citing, yeah, yeah, no, it's it's not their study. Well, you know, you know, this is something I wanted to highlight as well that sometimes these studies have presumptions about happiness is correlated to wealth or, or you know certain types of things. Right. But even right. if we don't have these studies, even if we just look at society, right? Take a place like Canada. Canada has some of the most conservative people on earth and some of the most liberal people on earth. What do I mean by that? It has liberal people because it's a liberal society with egalitarian values, feminism, and you know, all that good liberal stuff is there. Yet you have refugees which have entered the country from sometimes some of the most conservative parts of the world. Mm -hmm. um, so for example, you'll have Syrian refugees which aren't even from Damascus, or homes, they're actually from villages, which are way more conservative than even the cities, and they've gone from those mm -hmm. um, villages to Canada. What do you find? Do you find that those people are writ large taking off their hijabs and going to clubs and dancing? What you find is that they're holding on to their identity, and Canadians are looking at them and thinking, give it a few years, they'll become liberal. Wait a minute, they're not becoming liberal. Wait a minute. They're thriving. Wait a minute. They're having children. They have their children are getting educated and, mm -hmm. and getting degrees and, and doing better than our children because our yeah. children, you know, they are, you know, just, um, you know, all these apps and getting, uh, you know, uh, all these types of. We definitely uh, social, have, social have grown. The, the communities, the, the immigration community has definitely grown leaps and bounds. And, you know, the honest fact is they need us. They need us. We work, we pay taxes, we bring a lot into the system, much more than we take out. And because, the Canadians are not having many children anymore. Liberal liberal values slow down the birth rates, and they yeah. need immigration. They need people who come are going to work and pay taxes. Like for instance, if you look at um, Japan, for instance, Japan doesn't have immigration, but they also have a low birth rate. They're saying Japan might not survive the next seventy years. They might have a societal collapse because for people who who are not uh, are not familiar with this, if you have too many old people. You have an inverted pyramid because old people cost a lot in healthcare, 
and you don't have enough taxpayers, you don't have enough people at the bottom of the pyramid to pay for all those people who need their pension, healthcare, etc. The older you get, the more you cost us in healthcare. So you want a pyramid like this, less old people, more young people who are working, paying into the system so we can take care of the elderly. Now, you have so many elderly, the first country to ever sell more diapers for the elderly than for the youth is Japan. Their pyramid is inverted. Their That's infrastructure nice. is under threat. They're thinking, hey, we cannot, there's going to be nobody to turn on the lights. There's going to be nobody to man these these infrastructures. They're, they're seriously facing a, a collapse within the next, they've, they've closed, in the last nine years, I think they've, I can't remember the numbers, I don't want to say them, but they've closed tons of schools because there's no children to go to these schools. So, what is it about their culture? Well, they have a high stress culture, very competitive culture. Uh, I think it's, I can't remember the stats, but it's something ridiculous. Like 30% of men are virgins. Like society depression, is having ailments. A big thing. What's that? Depression is a big thing. In a huge thing. There are a lot of suicide, but they are super sophisticated, intelligent people. They have a lot of uh, value and tradition. Like they're very, they're very conservative people as well, but their, their society is facing certain ch challenges. And these challenge, like they didn't make the the, fam the the nuclear family is not first and foremost. Yeah. Uh, what why do they call it the nuclear family? The nuclear family makes this village work. This village makes the city work, and this city makes this country work. The state work, and these states make this this country work. The nuclear family is the nucleus of a healthy civilization. Once that's under threat, even the Japanese, which I have a high regard and respect for, because they're so intelligent, they're so traditional, they're so conservative, they're, they're, they're in many ways, they're a beautiful people. But the nuclear family is not the center stage. It's, it's, it's success, academic success, business success, anything that takes the place of the nuclear family. That's why I always tell people, look, I, I always teach my kids, for us, first it's God, then family, then your career, then your business, then whatever. But don't put things above God and don't ever put things after Allah, don't ever put things more important than the family. The family's second. Then you're going to have a thriving civilization and you have inshallah progeny, etc. But any other, that's that's my criticism of liber liberalism. Liberalism has many beautiful uh, uh, things to teach, you know. Uh, you know, pursue happiness, but don't, don't harm others. Okay, I understand, you know, you want to be happy and don't harm others. There's limitations to how you acquire your happiness. However, what happens now, it's very divisive. My son, he's a you know a communist, vegan uh, with blue hair. My wife, she wants to do yoga in the park. And go ahead, uh, everybody pursue your own happiness. Everybody's going in their own direction. That's what happens in the West. Everybody has their own direction. There's nothing holding them. You know, in the Quran, it says, "Firm, hold on to the rope." Muslims, hold on to the rope. Mm. The one rope that unifies us all. Like we're we're united. We ha we share we share common values. Tomorrow, you see that in the West. They argue over which bathroom to go to. Their values are so different. They can't even share the bathroom. It's become such a controversial topic. Everybody has their own way, their own opinion. And that comes from John Locke's liberalism. Think your own way, be your own self, just don't harm me. Okay, well, what happens? It kills our unity. They don't have they don't have a nuclear family to speak of. The birth rate in Europe is 1.5. The last time I checked, it was 1.5. It's very, very low. So what happens is they want to teach their culture to our children. Like here in Quebec, they make, they pass certain laws so that I have to teach my children their culture. But I had my own kids. I, I abide by the law. Why do I have to teach them your culture? That's not, that's not in, that's not in the, the, the when we, we immigrated to this country, you know, like, first of all, when we immigrated to this country, they told us we could practice our religion as we see fit. You know, now today they say, if you, have, if you wear hijab, you can't work for the government. You can't get a job in the government. Like they change the the rules. Why? Because they see that their culture is shrinking and our culture is growing. And we have conservative family values. They don't. Yeah. But they, they want they, our kids. They want our kids to live and think like they did. Yeah. They're trying to plant they're trying they're trying to water a plastic plant and they want it to become into an oak tree. It, it's you could keep putting water on it for a million years. It's it's plastic, it's not gonna grow. There is a fundamental flaw when it comes to the liberal paradigm, when it comes to the individualistic, materialistic, naturalistic understanding of, of the world. If something is crooked from the very genesis, then it's not going to actually mm -hmm. go any further. I mean, yeah. let's look at 
the success of the West. Okay, let's put aside colonization and other things for now. That success is due to what? Is it due to secularism and liberalism? Or is it actually to do with their faith-based conservative values? When we look at the great thinkers of the West, who are we thinking of? We're thinking of Copernicus, we're thinking of Galileo, we're thinking of... They're Newton. pioneers. Their pioneers were religious men, conservative religious yeah. men. Uh, uh, Boyle, they, they were religious people. Okay, even if we look at, even if we look at the egalitarian philosophers, they came from a conservative background. So they may they may be okay. Look at these guys; they're espousing these values. Okay, yeah, but they're espousing values that if they were applied, they would never be born because mm -hmm. they were mm -hmm. the product of a conservative society. Mm -hmm. You know, exactly. the Victorians, right? The Victorians, they were pretty uh, conservative. And so, for amongst the Victorians, you had Darwin, and you had Spencer, and you had Russell, and you had uh, Huxley, you had all these people, and uh, they went on to push a particular pers uh, perspective, and then. That perspective that reinforced secularism, wh whether they uh, wanted that to happen or not. But if secularism is applied, then would you really have uh, people like Darwin in society? Would you really have people like Huxley in society and Ren Russell? So this is the thing. It's very easy for uh, for for somebody to say, you know, if if somebody is from a uh, I'll give you a, a, a more simpler example. If, if somebody's brought, brought up in the West and they say, we shouldn't have laws, you know, uh, to stop people from doing this and that because everyone should be assumed to be good. Well, go to, you know, Honduras and go to one of the cities outside Tegucigalpa. Yeah, just, just go to one of those village areas and then try and apply your egalitarian values. See how those cartels <laughs> are going to deal with you, right? So the thing is, people deny People deny the Hobbesian nature, which does exist in, in human nature, and they want to have this Rousseauian perspective, which is just simply false. They want egalitarian to be true, and they will apply things which are counterproductive to, for their own societies. Well, you know, I, I, I believe in a balance. Like, I don't want to sound like I'm, uh, you know, I, I believe there's a balance. But ultimately speaking, when you think about God, every, every human being is equally feeble. But if you don't believe in God, oh, this is great. This person is greater than this person. This person is great. No, me, when I see somebody did something great, I say, mashallah, that came from Allah. He was blessed by God. So for me, in that sense, every man is equal. Allah gives mercy to some and special mercy to others. Yeah. So, and it's, it, there's a wisdom behind it. There's a, there's a fitna behind it. There's a, there's a challenge for it, for us behind it. How our attitudes are going to be, et cetera. But that's how I see the world. So for me, yes, the world is equal. However, if there was no God, no, the world is not equal. The men are not equal. Some men are better than others, and some men should be, you know, then you then you can have eugenics. You're gonna have as Hitler said it. I hate to quote Hitler, you know, because he says you all you have is the dance of the apes. Life is more than that. Because the thing is, kids are gonna if you teach them atheism and and if you just if you teach kids atheism, eventually they're gonna they're gonna grow up to think might is right. If I can impose my way of life on you, I will. And so what? There's no punishment. There's no there's no morality. Why do you think Hitler was as crazy as he was? Why do you think Stalin was as crazy as he was? They were greatly influenced by Darwin Darwinism. Well, Stalin actually, influenced. Stalin, according to one account at least, uh, reading the origin led to his atheism. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So there are real life implications of, of these perspectives. Now, Alhamdulillah, we've done the stream for three and a half hours. Uh, to wrap things up, fr from your perspective, you know, we spoke about quite a few things, but in particular, when a prominent public intellectual like Huberman comes out and speaks about his faith, um, you know, that's something which is novel in society. You don't get people openly saying, I pray to God, I believe in God, This is this is who I am. Um, what would be your advice to young people who see someone like that, um, who they respect and who they love and who they've been, uh, you know, uh, getting a lot of uh, information from over the years, but then the schooling system that they come out of is teaching them liberal atheistic values. And now there's a contradiction. Now there's somebody who is rational, who is intellectual, who's scientific, and they believe in God and they have been taught all their life that's not what's supposed to happen what is your message to those young people well i would say look if you're truly honest and you want to 
and you want to know if there's a God. If you're truly honest, that's what it is. Honesty, humility. Yeah. Pray. Say, look, I'm gonna make I'm gonna do an experiment. I'm not sure if there's a God. I'm agnostic. I'm not sure. I'm wondering. Pray to God. God, show me. If you exist, show me your truth. Show me it. Lead me. And then read and study and read and study. And sooner or later, inshallah, you'll not only build a faith, you can even build a level of certainty. I think he was just honest with himself. He looked around. He was on because a lot of it is it's not it's not a question of logic. So many people are logical, and you'll find atheists and theists it's more psychology humble yourself pray to god and eventually you'll develop a connection with god and if you don't if you don't in my opinion if, if you don't you're not only going to suffer in this world your, your body and your lifestyle will become a prison everything you enjoyed will bring you equal and even more pain in this life the more the greater your life was the more sad it's going to be when you have to die when when you you part ways with the people you 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 love so much not only are you going to suffer in this life, you're going to suffer in the next. Be careful with your health, but also even more so with your spirituality, with your faith. That's more important than the body. Once you have that, the body is secondary. Yes, you can have a healthy body. Yes, you can have a healthy and enjoyable, happy life. But none of it means anything if you have no connection with God. This is the most important thing. And I'm telling you this as a person who, you know, I, I just saying that I have nothing to gain from telling you this other than I want to see people... Uh, be happy. I want to see people have success. I want to see people be on the right path. There's nothing, I don't, I don't, there, there's no monetary incentive. You know, it's for you. It's not for me. It's not for God. God doesn't need our prayers. God doesn't need us. He's completely self-sufficient. Doesn't need us. You need Allah. And that's the only way. Every other path, in my opinion, leads to misery. So, uh, you know, I, th I think Uberman, I'm, I'm happy he, he's swimming against the current i think in the future there's going to be a major swing towards theism everybody's going to want to be theistic and inshallah you know it'll, it'll come sooner than later but like we had an atheistic wave we're going to have a theistic wave you know and paradigms are going to shift but me i hope my children and my children's children never f fluctuate with the times and what's cool and what's not no we were we were muslim and inshallah my progeny our your progeny inshallah will be muslim for sure. till the end because for us, that's the most important thing. Allah is the most important thing and nothing else. No amount of money, no amount of friends, no amount of fame, no amount of fortune, no amount of anything can ever break that firm handhold. Absolutely, absolutely. I really love the way that you put it. And that's a that's the point we want to end it on full stop. Allah is everything. and Without Allah, you are nothing and you will not enjoy anything. If, if there's anything in this life which is pleasurable, it's a relationship with Allah. Jazakallah khair for us. It's always Allah nice Allah. to have you. You gave me, gave us three and a half hours of your time, and you're super busy. I'm sure <laughs> you have some, some things no coming problem, up. Brother. As we end this, film, I'd just like to recommend uh, a book, um, David uh, Eagleman's The Brain, uh, The Story of You. So this is, um, you know, what I cited earlier when I gave the story of the London cab offices. It's a book I just downloaded on Kindle today. Highly recommend it. So until next time. Inshallah, brother. Wa rahmatullahi wa Thank you, brother.